hello to each and every one of you here. There are so many of you here today. It's so wonderful to have you with us on this Sunday, on this very chilly Sunday <laughs> here in Cape Town with the snow-capped mountains, oh my goodness. Welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for joining the Call to Cares monthly paint and sip featuring Kim Moby. We're so excited to have you here with us. Um, I wanted to do a quick little introduction. My name is Alex. I'm from the Call to Care team. And I also wanted to just give you a little bit of context about Call to Care. So Call to Care is a nonprofit organization that improves lives through education. We have several different initiatives um, ranging from food security through to life skills development. Um, and thanks to you here today that are not only going to be painting absolutely gorgeous pictures, but you are also contributing to a very good cause. So please, can you give yourselves an awkward round of applause in your own rooms, woo! <laughs> and pat on the backs. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us because without paint and sip, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of what we do. Um, our hero program um, is called the Igadi Project. So we implement vegetable gardens all throughout the um, Cape Town Peninsula in low income areas. And we, um, from schools and community um, centers, um, and we also invite everyone to come and join us on bi-weekly volunteer projects. So um, please do follow our platforms. Um, call to care with the number two, you'll find us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. We have a website. We are on the internet. <laughs> Um, there are several other ways that you can contribute. You can volunteer with us. Again, like I mentioned, we've got bi-weekly programs. Um, and there's also a monthly contribution. So if you um, are passionate about our cause, you are welcome to also donate monthly. Just putting that out there. Okay, so without further ado, Let's get on to paint and sipping. Yay, I have my tea here. I'm not drinking wine, I've got my tea. Um, I've stopped sharing my screen so that you can see me in full view. But um, if you do have wine, I hope that you have your glass full. I know Kim's got a glass of wine on hand too. Um, we do call it paint and sip for a reason because the more that you sip, the easier it is to paint. <laughs> Um, so, one of the most important things about paint and sip is that you prep your area. So we do encourage that you put relaxing music on in the background, that you have a cup of tea or a glass of wine on hand, that you have everything that you need in front of you. You've all been delivered a box to your door, so you should have everything you need in that box, but we do also encourage to please get a jar of water and um, a rag or, you know, toilet paper or anything that you can dry your brushes with. That's quite important. So if you don't have those things, I would encourage that you go and get those things now. And also do make your area very warm and um, welcoming and relaxing because at the end of the day, this is gonna be a three, two to three hour experience where you will be mindful and present and focusing on this absolutely gorgeous picture. It's gonna be super relaxing. So we encourage you to please, um, we um, encourage you to please prep your area. Other rules, we don't really like rules, but other house rules are, there is a chat bar. So if at any point you want to chat to us, please do. Um, I do see a couple of people chatting already. That's awesome. Hi, Lorna. Hi, Chaz. So if you do want to chat to us at any point, you're welcome to put anything into the chat bar. Um, but because we are going to be doing this in a step-by-step -step format, so um, Kim is going to be taking us through it step-by-step, -step, and uh, you're really in absolutely amazing hands there. Um, she will also have 
you will also have an opportunity to ask questions. She will say, do you have any questions? And at that point, you please put your mics on and feel free to ask questions. You don't have to worry about picking, putting the paintbrushes down, going and typing in the chat bar. We love to hear from you. So keep your cameras on because we also, you know, Kim might say, please pick your painting up so I can see what you're doing. Um, and that way you've got your camera on, it's already ready. You just unmute your mic and ask us whatever question you need. Throughout the um, paint and sip experience, in order to give everybody an opportunity to catch up, I will also be asking Kim questions about her life and her career and, you know, just weird and wonderful facts about Kim. So this is also going to be quite a nice relaxing way to connect with Kim um, and get to know who she is as well. Great. So I think that I have covered everything. Very important. Could everyone please change their names on Zoom to what your name is? Um, sometimes when we are trying to um, speak to you because you've asked us a question and if your name for some other reason is 1234.ixl, it's a little bit awkward <laughs> for us asking you the question. So please make sure that your name is um, in full so that we can, we can um, call you correctly. And is everyone ready? I can see you. I've got you on gallery view. So give me a thumbs up if you're ready to go. I know that you might seem a little bit anxious and overwhelmed. Don't worry. You're in good hands, you know, and you're going to be very, very um, proud of your work. You are going to display it proudly behind your bathroom door so everyone can see it. I promise. <laughs> okay, great. Everyone that has wine glasses, please put them up. Let's say cheers before we go. I've got my radiating positivity mug of tea. I can see all of you. Cheers. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful experience. Kim, how are you? Are you ready? I am ready. I am ready. Hello, everybody. I'm going to share my screen with you in a moment. I just want you to all get a, get a load of the amazing environment I've been given to teach you all in. Um, so this is my desktop. I want to just say cheers to everybody first. Um, whether you've got tea or wine, I'm lucky enough to have wine. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to just share my top-down camera with you, which should be working. I do have some tech support coming in. Um, um, okay, great. Yes, we're getting there. Um, I'm not used to Mac. I'm used to um, PC. So this is all, um, it's working. It's working. It's miraculous and it's working, which is apparently what Mac does. So It's um, fantastic. <laughs> it looks so great. I can see everything. I can see the box. Can everybody else right. see the box? Let us know by means of a thumbs up. Um, if you're, if you're, both of your views are working. Yes, beautiful. Everyone sees it. Great. <laughs> So I'm going to do a little unboxing. I think a lot of people have already opened their boxes because obvious. Um, so here is my box. Uh, there's a little booklet that I sort of put together. There's a, a tiny little printing error, which we will probably ignore completely. Um, and you can see a step-by-step -step of a, a, an overview of how to get through it. There's an apron, which you can either wear or like me, just get paint all over your clothes because that's, that's how I roll, yo. Um, so this is also a really nice protector for nice dinner tables. Alex, thank you for sacrificing your dinner table for, for a good cause. Um, you should have brushes. Uh, these are quite nice little brushes. Um, I use these in my studio. They're very practical. I'm a bit of a fanatic as a teacher for keeping your brushes clean. So if you could all make sure that you have a great big bottle of water, um, that would be very, very useful. And then some kind of rag or cloth because um, just wiping it on your clothes is only convenient if you have studio clothes like I do in my life. Um, but try and keep your brushes clean in between uh, colors because otherwise everything just looks like mud. It's not a, it's not a good look. Um, so then we unbox the canvas, which is sort of my favorite thing. 
I mean, I love the paint, but the blank canvas has got this kind of magical, I could be anything kind of vibe. Um, and then it turns into sort of whatever I end up doing, which to my mind looks eh, but it, yeah, I can't seem to stop. So hopefully you guys are in the same boat and there's just this addictive quality to making art. Uh, now what I'm doing is I'm sticking a little bit of sticky stuff under the canvas just so that it doesn't move on the table because I get a little over enthusiastic sometimes. Um, I'm going to do the same thing under my canvas. It's going to or under my palette and it's going to stop everything from flying in theory. In theory, I'm not making any promises just yet. Um, there is wine after all, so things could go in any direction. And then we've got all of these gorgeous colors that have been specially individually packed. Um, and that is the unboxing. So to start with, uh, you'll see the very first thing talks about the grid system. So you're not absolutely compelled to use the grid. Uh, the, the thing about the grid is it gives you a good sense of proportion. It lets you know not to put the mountains right up to the top edge. It lets you know not to put the grapevines all the way down to the bottom edge. It lets you really get an idea that the horizon line is straight through the middle of the canvas. So I'm going to do a scooping out of all my colors onto the canvas, uh, onto the why do I keep saying canvas? I mean palette. Uh, yes. So I'm going to scoop out colors onto the palette um, while you guys draw in your grid. So what you're going to do is divide your canvas into four pieces. So one line up the middle, one line across the horizon, also in the middle. And then very, very lightly, you can divide those quarters. So I'm going to do it in this corner. You can see here I'm dividing my canvas. It's actually off center. That one's there. So I'm just doing this by eye. I'm actually not using a ruler because I'm hardcore like that. Um, and then if you want to, for real accuracy, you can divide these into quarters as well. The useful thing about the grid is that it actually lets you know what areas all of the different things go into. So when you look here, you can see there's a large area of yellow here. What the grid tells me about that large area of yellow is that it sort of starts there-ish and then scoops under. So the grid, if you look inside this little pamphlet book, will tell you the areas that you're going to be using. And it helps so, so much with drawing, especially with something like a landscape where it's very easy to get the mountains going all the way up to the top, where actually, if we look at these little spots, uh, that's sort of in the top corner here, you can see that the mountains don't actually even touch those. They kind of hang out underneath. And so what I'd like you to do is just paying attention to the grid. You don't have to follow stuff too precisely in a landscape. It's a very forgiving subject. But try and get these overall shapes onto your, onto your canvas. And uh, while you're busy with that, I want to ask if anybody has any questions to start off with. Um, Louise, I did see that your hand was raised. Um, I wasn't sure if that's because you wanted to ask a question or that might have been a... No, I seem to have lost um, Kim's um, screen. Um, so I can follow vocally, but not, I uh, can't see what she's actually doing. So I might need a bit of help um, just selecting. Okay. Um, do you have, I'm, I'm trying to think about how I can assist from so far away, but um, I think in the top right hand corner, there are options to put it into speaker um, screen or to put it into gallery view. So 
um, just try and toggle some of those buttons in the right top hand corner and you might be able to get Kim's screen back. Otherwise, maybe Kim, what I would suggest is just popping your, um, showing the front view camera occasionally, um, you know, after each step, just so that maybe Louise can see it that way. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, I can, I can try doing that. Um, I'm going to uh, lift it up now. Um, I think, I think I can go back. Um, we have this wonderful tech support, I think, going upstairs at the moment. Um, I'm not very used to Mac. So this is what I've done. It's basically exactly the same thing as what you would see in your book. So you can probably, for the first six steps, just follow what you see in the book. Um, if you are struggling with visuals, I'm gonna go back to the screen share now, um, mostly because I just don't have enough hands. Um, so I'm not used to Mac, so this is just gonna take me a nano. Don't, don't worry, um, you can hear me. I'm not gonna leave and go back because I see it sending me a message to say your video is stopped. So don't worry, let me not hold up anything. I'll come back into the, I've already drawn my grids and everything anyway, because I've been following the book. So don't, don't let me hold this up. I'll be back in a minute. I'm just going to leave and come back. Okay. 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 Um, cool. Yeah. Just follow, follow in the book. Um, if you do get delayed. No problem. Okay. See you now. So what I'm doing right now is I'm actually just laying out all my colors because I literally just unboxed. Um, as long as you've got a clean brush, you can dip into your colors. So I spent quite a lot of time cleaning this brush off, making sure you'll see there's nothing in the base of the brush. This, this metal thing's called a ferrule. I am an art geek, so I know these things. Um, the ferrule should actually be as clean as possible. You don't want any residual paint floating around in the base, but then you can, you can dip into any color and just pop it on your palette. Um, what I've done in the instructions is to use the yellow to just fill in some background there. Now you don't have to do this, but if you do, I want you to keep the paint as thin as possible because you do want it to dry. And we're having one of the coldest winters in living memory, as far as I'm concerned. I'm, I, I've been frozen for about three days. So um, try and keep the paint quite thin at this point to make sure that it actually does dry in this icy weather. Uh, obviously, if you enjoy thick paint, uh, you can actually make it thicker at the end or towards the end. But just for this beginning section where we're blocking in colors and filling in the, the canvas with color, what I prefer is if you just try and keep the paint quite thin Keep your brushes super, super clean in between. So I don't know if you can see, I'm gonna actually demonstrate to you how to clean a brush really, really well. So if you've got a proper brush cleaner, you get to scrape the brush along the bottom of the bottle. Um, you can do that with a plastic um, dish scrubber. Um, not one of the ones with the foam on, but one of the ones that's kind of made out of a knitted thing. And that doesn't damage your bristles and then you just dry out really well in between and you can sometimes see a little bit of color coming off and you just go back in and dunk, dunk, dunk and until the color doesn't come off anymore. Then you know your brush is super, super clean. Um, you also wanna control the dampness in your brush. Sometimes you want it to be wet. Sometimes you want it to be completely dry. It gives you different textures. It gives you different atmospheres. You can do a lot just by changing the amount of water actually sitting in your brush. So the next section talks about mixing a blue. So the sky is so many different shades of blue over the course of a day and over the course of a year that there's no such thing really as sky blue except that one color that you get in the middle of summer in the middle of the day. Um, and I think what we're gonna try and do is mix that particular color. So I want you to put down a nice, uh, little lump of blue. Um, 
it doesn't have to be as big as the one I've made there. I'm going to actually divide this particular blue up into two parts because uh, I don't need to spend a lot of paint on mixing. It's useful if you are unaccustomed to mixing colors to put down more than you need because it gives you a lot of extra room to experiment with tones and colors. Uh, also, don't be afraid to get out a new palette if you've used up all the space on your current palette because one of the most interesting things about art is the amount of stuff that can be created with just tone or just color. So you really want to experiment with that quite a lot. Like I say, always try and have a very, very clean brush in between. We've given you two parts of white because there's actually a lot of pigment in all of the other colors. And the white helps to modify that and give you a lot more body to work with so that you can use a solid color. It also gives the paint more opacity. So when I say opacity, I mean, it doesn't look transparent. You can't see the canvas through it. Um, you can always use a very thin wash of blue. I'm going to do that with this. Now I'll show you what that looks like. If you use a thin wash of blue, like you would with a watercolor, if any of you have played with watercolor before, you end up with quite a different type of color than you would end up with if you mixed blue and white together. So you'll see if I put these two next to each other, I think even, even with a zoom camera, you can see quite a lot of detail um, of the different, this is a much flatter blue. This has got a lot more texture because of the canvas behind it. So the canvas actually gives its texture to the paint if it's transparent because the thickness changes over all of the grains. So what I'm going to ask you to do is make a thin layer of an opaque blue. So if you can see how I'm mixing that, it's about equal parts white and blue. And I'm not mixing a huge amount. I'm mixing uh, about, a, about two brush loads. So when you load your brush up, it should actually, I actually really like this video medium because I can show you some details that you wouldn't be able to see on a stage. You can see about how much brush I've got, um, about how much paint I've got on this brush. And this, for the size of canvas we've got, should actually be just the right amount. So you might want to mix a little more or um, about the same amount. I would not suggest trying to mix less because then you've got to remix it. And the problem that happens if you try and remix is that you end up with different tones and you end up having two completely different blues. Um, and that can split your painting into pieces that you don't actually want. So it doesn't really matter how you apply this blue. Try to apply it quite thinly, but also make sure that you fill in, you can see there, this is quite a textured little gap. So you wanna make sure that the canvas texture is filled in. If you are struggling, use either more paint or a little bit of water. I think I've mixed just about the right amount to cover this properly and then working back into it, we should get good coverage over this whole sky area. And then once you're done with that, I'm going to strongly recommend that you have a sip of whatever you have in front of you. Hopefully it is delicious and or warm. <laughs> uh, and then let, let that dry for a little bit because working into wet paint gives you a very different effect than working into dry. Also clean your brushes in between. Um, clean, clean, clean brushes. I will probably annoy you with that throughout the entire video. You're never gonna forget clean brushes, clean brushes, clean brushes. Um, Alex, do you have any questions there? Um, I don't at this stage. Um, I do. Uh, there are one or two people that are just struggling to see the screen share, but I think because most people can see the screen share, I think it might be an individualistic 
technical issue and what I suggest is just exiting and coming back into the session using the same link. That might solve the problem. Um, but I don't have any questions at the moment from anyone in the chat room. I can see you um, on my second screen over here, which is why it looks like my face is looking in a different um, section. So I can see each and every one of you painting. <laughs> Big Brother is watching. So, um, so yes, just for an FYI. Um, does anybody have any questions at this stage? I do. I think, you know, this is also a nice opportunity for me to ask Kim a few questions about her art, etc. But before we do that, I just want to make sure everyone is comfortable at this stage and we will give you a little bit of time to catch up. Anybody got a question right now? We all good? Cool. I'm seeing some thumbs up. So it looks like we're fantastic. So, um, Kim, Tell us a little bit about your, um, your sort of art career. Where is your studio? What type of paintings do you like to paint? Um, give us a little bit of insight into the world of Kim's art. My paint stained little world. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is, it's very paint stained and I'm still astonished that I get away with it as a job, um, sort of, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've pretty much always done it. I tried doing normal people's jobs and then ended up painting again. So um, I work from a little studio in Campus Bay at the moment and I do mostly portraits. Uh, I very rarely do landscapes. In fact, I think over the last two years, the only landscapes I've done have been for painting. So, but I love living in and looking at landscapes. I just find them intimidating. I think faces somehow for me are actually easier because there's just so much going on in nature that I feel hopelessly intimidated. Um, it's probably also one of the reasons that I'm a hopeless photographer is that nature is really, really just too much to put on a canvas. Um, there, are, there are different techniques that one can use to make that happen but I find human faces take me into a different headspace. So I can actually focus on the person and the personality and their story rather than trying to copy the astonishing stuff that nature throws at me. Um, I've been doing that for about five years on and off and sculpting as well. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. Quite versatile. That's basically my studio practice is a lot of portraiture, quite a few sculptures and I'm moving more into um, figure drawing, figure studies, figure painting and, and very, very large canvases with sort of more, um, I, I don't want to say mythological, but uh, sort of the old master theme kind of running through them. So that's, that's, that's my work. That's what I do. Lovely. Um, right, so just so that we know that everyone is feeling comfortable to move on to the next step, can we all get a thumbs up? But you don't, you just simply have to lift your hand. Um, and I think not yet, not yet, some people saying in the chat bar. Okay, that's perfectly fine. Um, so, and you know, We've been doing paint and sip for quite a while and you have featured many times, you know, in our private events, in our corporate events. Um, and, you know, we have quite a, a good sense about, you know, the sort of world of a professional artist and there are actually several challenges um, posed to artists in South Africa. Um, what you know, in your experience, what is it like to be an artist in South Africa? So, um, oh, it's, it's a wonderful country to be an artist in, um, just in terms of subject matter and inspiration and the sheer huge cultural, um, I, I, I don't, I don't, I get the word burden, but that's not it. It's just the, the cultural value that we have in this country. It's, it's, it's enormous. Um, we have 
people coming in from all over Africa and all over the world. Uh, we have a huge tradition and history of um, cultures going all the way up um, both coasts. So we have, we have so much going for us. Um, we also have uh, the art and sport kind of schmooshing together. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that has probably detracted from both. So that makes it very, very difficult for both arts and sports to really thrive because they're, they're separate. They're, they're, they're completely separate things, but they've been smooshed together. And um, I feel like there are so many great sports people and artists in this country that are forced to compete um, against each other unnecessarily. Uh, but that said, the talent that rises is astonishing. We have some of the best art in the world. Um, we have um, artists from South Africa have won massive international competitions and grants and residencies, very, very prestigious, uh, everything really. So we have the talent, we have the skills. Um, I feel like South African society wants very, very badly to be behind it, but we don't really know how quite a lot of the time. So um, being an artist in South Africa is, it's a thrill, but it's also a trial by fire for a lot of us. Uh, and if you, can, if you can make a good go of creating art in this country, you're ahead. You're just ahead. Um, you're incredibly fortunate with all of the influences that you've got it, as an artist living here. Uh, I think anybody who's taken art seriously here can take it anywhere in the world. Uh, we're, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're very lucky and also very, very unlucky at exactly the same time in exactly the same ways. Yeah. And um, I've actually had similar conversations with a lot of the other artists. Um, but I mean, you have, I mean, you're really established, Kim. You've, you've traveled, you have, I mean, you've been in humongous art exhibitions and your artwork um, has won awards. I mean, so, you know, I think you saying that, you know, with its challenges, it is possible to make like quite a good career out of it. And, and if you can make it in South Africa, you can make it anywhere in the world. I think that's actually very inspiring. Yeah, this is, I mean, people say about New York, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. But I think uh, compared to trying to be an artist in South Africa, New York is kind of bubble wrapped and coddled. Um, there's a lot of competition, but there's also a lot of space. Here, there's a lot of competition and there isn't a lot of space. We're, um, we're smaller. We're on the end of Africa, which is a 13 hour flight from most places at least. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but we do have a huge amount of input and we have a huge amount of energy and we have the type of energy you can't really find anywhere else in the world. True. So um, I would say that you, you are very, very fortunate to be an artist sort of learning from South Africa, but being an artist in South Africa is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> um, I suggest wine. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, just it's, it's... <laughs> um, okay, so I, um, while... Can I ask a question? Yes. Hi, I'm Susan. Hi, Susan. Hi, Susan. We, hi, so this is our first time, and we didn't think about the pallet thing. Um, so we were using like a little plastic lid, but that's got a bit small now. If we use a, a plate, does this paint come off? So the best way to get paint off a ceramic plate is just hot water and soap. It comes off super easily. This particular oh. plate is from Dala. It's okay. a acrylic. And hot water, if you just pour a boiling kettle over the plate, the paint basically floats yeah. off. Okay. Um, a little bit of soap will help, 
But it's super no, no, no. And you can use your bucks, Susan. Use your bucks. Upcycle. <laughs> oh, okay. What? Okay, we can use our box too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can use the box. It might absorb a bit more paint than what you want, but the ceramic plate is actually also just fine. Sorry, I missed that. It was noisy. The box will absorb oh. the paint. No, the box might absorb some of the moisture from the paint. And that might make you go through paint a little faster. But if you're, if you're not too worried about that, the box is a fantastic solution um, because it's always available. Um, Sorry, our speaker is very soft. We struggle to hear. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's very soft. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, what no, I think it's us, not you. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, um, just okay. While, I'm, while I'm on the mic, I just want to explain what I'm doing. I'm painting some white over the, the dark marks. Don't feel like you have to do this over yours. If you want to, you can. But all I'm doing is I'm just putting a thin coat of white paint over the darker marks where I've sketched this in because I didn't use a pencil. So I can't actually erase. So all I'm doing here is don't stress about it. Don't think this is something you have to do. I'm just deleting. This is Tipex. This is the artist Tipex. Hmm. But it looks like most people are ready to actually move on to the next step too. To the, so great. Okay, fantastic. So the next step, I'm just going to keep tipexing while I talk. The next step is going to be us making a grey. Now you'll notice that there is no black in your palette. There are no black tubs of paint. Um, what most professional artists do is they actually, uh, well I say most, most naturalistic Sorry, is there a question? Yes, I'm, getting, I'm getting partial voices here. Um, so, um, Rachel, can you mute your mic for me, please? If everybody can just keep their mics muted during the instruction, then we won't get that feedback. Thank you. I am trying to also mute it from your, from my end. So I think what's happening is that we're getting a little bit of feedback. Um, so I think maybe uh, if, if everybody could just pause for a second and just check that your mic is muted. So have a look on your screen and just double check that your mic is muted. Uh, it seems to be it seems to be fixed now, but I haven't stopped talking yet, so it's hard to tell. <laughs> no, it is. It is. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay. It's all good. Yeah. Okay, fabulous. So to mix this grey, as I keep I keep harping on about the clean brush thing. Um, Temporarily, it's fine to leave your brush in the water um, if you feel like you need to move quickly. Um, I'd suggest not leaving them there in there for the long term because the wood tends to swell and then the paint cracks and you end up with a dreadful smelling bucket of disgustingness. Um, so to mix the color that we're going to go for now, you're going to use a little bit of this blue that you put down in your palette and you're going to use a bit of the brown. And this makes a very standard gray that's got a, a lovely warm um very natural tone to it so it's not a, a flat gray it's kind of got a bit of uh life i i i, I struggle to not use the the woo woo type artsy words i know everybody kind of gets used to hearing the artsy words but i try and actually be more specific in my usual language but I think it's got to do with the transparency of the colors and the amount of light that reflects through the different pigment particles. But you can see what I'm doing here is I'm mixing the brown and the blue together. And what it does is it makes this very, very, very deep gray. And I'm going to spread some out here in this corner where you can see we've got, um, just, just as a demo, you can see that is pretty, pretty dark. Now for this purpose, for a landscape, this is a very slightly green tone. And so it becomes the perfect black slash gray. 
If you want to warm it up a little bit, you can add more brown. So you end up with a warmer tone of gray. Mm. Um, Kim, when you're mixing your colors, just keep it in the sort of center of your screen if you can, because I think you're mixing that color like right at the bottom of the screen and some people actually can't see it. Right. Just push so that thing right up. In. That's it. Um, yeah, up, 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 up. That should be better. A little bit more, if possible. Uh, I'm going to try not to knock anything over. Yeah, there we go. That's perfect. Perfect. Swivel is the answer. And then okay. Yunus, Yunus, Yunus um, asks, how did you get the grey? So I mixed the blue. You'll have a pot of blue paint and you'll have a pot of brown paint. And this was one of the very first art lessons I got when I was about eight years old, and I think it changed my life, is that mixing brown and blue gives you something so close to black, it may as well be black. Um, and I've used this combination to do full portraits. So just blue, just black, and then white. And these three together, I've actually created full portraits from that. Um, you'd think you'd need a red, but it's astonishing how pink the, bl the uh, brown becomes when you mix it with the blue. So that actually develops a really beautiful pink. It's a pinky brown. Um, the, the wonderful thing about paint is that it doesn't behave like light. Paint behaves like paint. It's basically a sophisticated kind of mud. And it does its own thing. Um, so what you mix together to get yellow with a camera or with Photoshop is not what you mix together to get anything in a normal artist's palette. Um, if, you, if you try and make yellow from other colors in an artist's palette, you don't actually get yellow at all, you get mud. So you're gonna use the blue and the brown together and you're gonna mix them and you're gonna make this sort of greeny, gray, which is a really, really lovely foundation tone for your shade in a landscape. And the next step that we're going to do is take a little dollop of that and we're gonna mix some white into it and start painting the furthest mountains. So what you do is you put down a little dollop of white and you add bits of the gray to it until you get a significantly different tone. So you can see there's a gradation there, starting from a light to a dark at the bottom. Um, this gives you a huge amount of power um, to create distance in the landscape. So try and get a more or less uniform or even tone in this little pile of paint that you've got going here. Um, it should end up looking kind of uh, military gray. If you, think of, if you think of sort of that far distance in a landscape is that misty tone. And we're gonna fill in the, the furthest mountains. If you look at the instructions, I talk about how this is like a cardboard cutout type thing. So the bottom doesn't really matter that much. What really matters is your top edge. You want your top edge to be pretty neat and tidy. Not perfect because we're still gonna lay clouds in. But we're gonna lay clouds in from the top and we're gonna slightly overlap that. So you want the edge to be not gloopy. If you've got a large, thick, like I'm gonna put down a, a huge amount of paint there. I don't know if you could see it very clearly that there's actually a, a big lump of paint there. If you try and go back over that with cloud white, that is gonna show through drastically. So you want your edge to be quite neat and quite flat on the top of this mountain so that when you come back with your clouds, you have minimal interference from the layers underneath. And then just spread that down, spread that down. A lot of this is gonna be covered by trees that come over the front. But you want to get a basic mountainy type concept going here. And then slowly as you come forward, 
you're going to use less and less white in the gray. And you can even start adding a little bit of yellow to make it more green. But I, what I would suggest is for now, just make it darker. So I'm mixing back on top of this because I'm quite tidy at this point. Um, and I'm going to try and mix a gray that's slightly darker than I had before. So this gray is slightly lighter. Add slightly more of the dark to it. And now I've got something that's almost exactly the same as I had before. Uh, now, in order to stop myself from mixing all my color on the palette all at once, I'm going to take a lump of this out and put it on the side. Actually, I, can, I may as well just pop it in there. Um, I don't want it to be too thick because I do want it to dry in this cold weather. But just to avoid wasting, I'm going to put a little bit of that on the side and put some of this dark color in there. So what you want is to make sure that the next color that you put down is a little bit darker than the one that you put down before. This gives you that cardboard cutout look that you get in distance painting or distance photographs. You end up with these layers uh, on top of one another. So this feels pretty much dark enough for me to do the next hills now. And I don't know if you can see clearly there, I think you can actually, you can see quite nicely that the, the tone that you're getting on that edge really does make them look like one is in front of the other. And you end up with a much, uh, much more natural sort of landscape than if you tried to paint them on piggledy piggledy, piggle, da, 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 da. My mouth does work, I promise. Higgledy, piggledy. Piggledy, piggledy. That is, it is actually in a dictionary somewhere, I promise. Um, so try and just layer those in, keeping those edges as flat and as tidy as possible. And just at the moment, it's kind of coloring in from, from the horizon or from the top of the mountain downwards, you're, you're coloring in. And then while you guys do that, I want to ask if there are any questions. I don't see anybody. Um, oh, so from Cara, my gray is looking super green. What do I do to make it more gray? <laughs> uh, definitely more brown. If, if, if it's very, very green, it means that the blue is showing through quite a lot. The blue is called phthalo blue and it's a very intense blue. It has a habit of taking over a palette. So it's, it's just the fact that there's a lot of blue. What you want to do is try and make sure that there's a slightly larger amount of brown than, than the blue. If you're still struggling, you can take a clean, clean brush and dip into your red um, if you feel like that's really driving you completely crazy and you can't seem to get the brown white. But when you go into the red, I'm going to demonstrate here, you really want to use a tiny amount because you don't want to lose that green. The green is important because otherwise it's sort of a Karoo landscape rather than a vineyard landscape. Although well, some quite good wines come out of the Karoo, so I might actually just be talking nonsense there. But a when I say a tiny amount of red, I mean like, you can see that is a tiny amount of red. And then I'm cleaning my brush as well. So when I go in there, what you want to be careful of is it turning too purple. If you have a very high blue content in this gray and you add red to it, it's going to go purple. Now, there are some things to be said about far distant mountains being purple. Um, it is valid, but what you don't, really want is for them to look like a um, like a glade air freshener. Um, you want them to kind of have a much more natural tone. So I've, I've mixed this red in with this gray tone now and you'll see it's quite purple um, compared to the original. The original is actually quite green. Um, this is perhaps a bit more neutral 
if I put this in, I'm going to put it in as a texture so it doesn't interfere too much. Oh, there we go, that's the correct term. So I'm just going to put this in as a texture on that mountain, sort of unevenly. Um, I'm not sure how much difference you can see on the monitor, but if you look at your painting, if you've done this, you'll see that there's a difference in so the value, the quality of the green, of the gray, it, it's, it's much warmer, um, but it definitely has a lot less green in it. So red will always neutralize green, but it might turn things purple. So you have to balance those two. Um, go for brown first and then, then start adding red if you're still struggling. Um, that is, that, very is that working for you? Good question, Cara. Um, and just for the sake of authenticity and keeping this show super real, that happens to be my baby's sister. And I know right now she's oh, dying of embarrassment. Hello. <laughs> and just crawled under the table. <laughs> oh, it's a good question. It's a very good question. It's, a good question. <laughs> it's, the, kind of, it's the kind of question that um, I actually struggled with for a very long time when I was learning how to mix colors. So it's, it's a useful question for everybody else as well. So don't crawl too far under that table, Alex. <laughs> no, no, not me, Cara. <laughs> oh. uh, funny. Are there any additional questions or is this all kind of going perfectly? It doesn't look like there are any other questions from the audience. Fabulous. Fabulous. Just everyone is deep in concentration and awesome. looks like they're really enjoying it, which is fantastic. Okay, this is good. Um, you know, I think at this point we love to see with everyone's progress. So um, feel free yeah. to, show us your, to show us your paintings. Kim, can you see a, a gallery view of some of the participants just so that um, you can at least see where everyone is at. I know some people um, are sitting at tables that are quite far away. Don't worry to like put your I am going to ask tech support to help me oh, yes, see everybody's you. stuff because you I actually Kerry don't come in just to pop in the gallery view for Kim. But um, yeah, the pieces are looking really nice. Like there's this awesome depth um, from the faraway mountains. Lovely. Sarah Knight, your piece looks absolutely lovely. Shirley, stunning. I like those two. Um, it's really nice. Like most people have got the contrast between the lighter mountain in the background and the darker one. Can you can you see on your end, Kim? Oh, you're still you're still um, getting there. I'm just getting getting your wonderful tech support to help me. Thank you. Cool. Oh, fabulous. Yes, I can see. Oh, this is looking good. Yes. Okay. I can see. I can see. Lovely. Nice flare. Yeah. Very nice. And Renata. I'm seeing good results. I actually like how it, it looks like there's a little bit of sunlight. Um, yeah. In your mountains there. That's nice. Lovely, guys. And Shirley's got two. Um, make sure that you. A little paint party happening in Shirley Sandy's house. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, try to make sure that your mountains go all the way across your pa your um, canvas. Um, I can see a few. Yeah, look, this is all looking really beautiful. Um, wow, Lorna, where you guys so are at. And I know Lorna's using oils because she prefers to paint in oil. So oh, fabulous! Okay. So you might struggle a little bit with the layering that I'm going to be doing. So use very, very thin coats of the oil because it's not going to uh, dry. So I don't know if you use very impasto, um, Lorna. If you are using very impasto um, colors, then you're going to go through a lot of paint, uh, which is fine if that's your thing. But it might just, just, yeah, I mean, if you use oils, you probably already know to use very thin in the background, um, fat over lean, the, the, the usual, the usual shtick. Um, there's, a, I, I love oil paints. Um, they do have a very different instruction set from acrylics, though. 
So if you have any questions for me that are specifically about oils in this particular painting, I'm going to have to wing it because I actually haven't done this painting in oils yet. Mm -hmm. But I think just making sure your background is thinner than your foreground and use a ton of solvent in the background so it has a chance to evaporate and keep a window open so you don't get a headache. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, but you, you probably already know these things. So. Um, and Sonia, your piece is looking good too. So we really have a lot of family in the house. Sonia is Stephen, and everyone knows Stephen from Call to Care's sister. She's here too. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's just so nice. Like paint and sip is one big happy family. Your painting's looking lovely. You just need to have two different coloured mountains there, Sonia. <laughs> So for those who are comfortable with where they're at, we're going to use exactly the same colors and we're going to take that red that we spoke about and start adding some yellow and red to the whole vibe. I'm just trying to figure out how to, uh, I just want to be able to see my palette. Oh, just minimize. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you. No, okay, I'll, I'll be able to do that from now on. The, um, the gap between Windows and Apple is, it's a, it's a learning curve. It's a learning curve. Um, but I'll get there. I think um, there's a lot good to be said about both. A lot bad, but <laughs> we won't get into the politics. Because my word, Apple versus Microsoft is is uh, it's a whole. Th I've I've got friends who are graphic designers, and they can spend a whole evening arguing. Um, so what we're going to do is we've put down a little bit of red and a little bit of yellow over there, and so what we're going to do is with a clean brush, always with a clean brush, pick up some of that grey that you mixed, put it down near those guys. Put your brush back in the water to clean. And then we're going to mix all of them together. We're going to mix the gray, the yellow, and the red. And we're going to end up with a different sort of brown. So we're going to have two different types of brown on the canvas. One is this kind of strange, muddy, translucentish color. And the other one is the lovely clean burnt umber brown that you got out of the tub. And I'm going to put them next to each other. I hope that this shows up. I'm not sure if it's showing up on the camera. Um, I'm trying to think where I'm going to show it. So I'm going to just show it along the horizon line here. So this is, this is the brown that comes out of the tub. And then This is the brown we just mixed, quite transparent and it's a lot redder. We're going to put a little bit of white in both of them, but we're going to try and mix unevenly. So this is a technical trick. Uh, it's not necessary if you don't feel like this is your bag, baby. Um, this is definitely my bag, baby. I love this heavily textured, mixed up orangey brown that you get in the Cape Winelands. So you're going to mix it a little bit more red and yellow in there to get it really messy. And then mix that across the bottom. And use a messy brush at this particular point. And you're going to see why I keep telling you about cleaning the brushes in between. Because the amount of mud and mess that you can make if Sorry, you don't can we can't see down that low. Can you move your your up a little bit, please? Thank you. No, that's better. Hmm. Can everybody see clearly? Yeah, that was perfect. Okay, there, you know, in Zoom, there's like a like a dashboard bar that sometimes cuts um, off the of people's screens. You see, I'm a hermit, so I don't actually interact with other humans that much. <laughs> um, so this whole Zoom thing is like, I do it maybe once a month. 
everybody else seems so comfortable with it and I just feel like a total country bumpkin and everybody else is all tech savvy. I feel like it's a little bit healthier <laughs> if you're not spending as much time on Zoom. <laughs> theory, right? That's a theory. It's not necessarily the real... <laughs> I mean, I do spend all my day in a studio on my own with paint fumes. It's, it's probably not healthier. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I'm, I'm actually enjoying the new technology quite a lot because... I feel like we get to have a bigger social circle than we've ever had um, and in a much more real way. So the old social media, Facebook and whatnot, you kind of got a very curated view. With Zoom, if somebody calls you and you've got a meeting and you don't have your makeup on and your house is in the state it's in Europe, you're, that's where you are. You, you don't get to curate it quite as much. Um, and your kids wander into the room or your cat wanders into the room or... You know, there, there are all those wonderful memes floating around. And it just feels more real to me than the old, the old social media that we've all become so... We do have a question with. from Sarah. Um, Sarah's yeah. asking, what are we mixing together? Red, grey and white? Um, so I've mixed... I'm trying to get an orangey-brown. I'm trying to make the, the, the soil colour of the Cape Winelands. So this is yellow, this is red, this is that mix of brown and blue that we made, that deep, deep gray. And then there's white on the other side. So what you wanna do is you wanna do this in a messy way. You don't want this to be too tidy. Uh, you're gonna use a little bit more white towards the top. You're gonna to use a little bit more red towards the bottom, but that just gives you a sense of depth. Uh, and then you're going to make this edge quite messy as well. So let the edge creep over and into. Because if you look at the grapevines and the vineyards, the leaves don't care, the soil doesn't care. They're not tidily edged. They're all over each other and inside and over and around. And then just fill in this with horizontal strokes. So the reason I say horizontal strokes is because the way that your eye sees landscape is layer by layer by layer by layer by layer. Um, we, we see what's in front of us and then we see that layered over what's behind us. And then we see that layered over what's behind that. So by using the horizontal strokes, you can fake. Um, you end up with an artificial sort of depth that gives you a lot more uh, sense of space than if you were to try and paint vertically. So if you were doing it this way, you would end up with a very different sensation looking into the painting because of the way that your eyes interpret space. Um, a lot of painting is actually just our eyes hacking um, reality. So painters will take a red and put it next to a blue because our eyes automatically interpret blue as being more distant our eye interprets red as being really close up and blue as being quite distant. And painters and artists can hack that. And we, we can kind of climb into somebody's brain and pretend that there's an actual three-dimensional landscape going on when it's just a flat canvas with pigment on it. Um, so the red and the blue and the direction of the stroke and the amount of white pigment and the transparency and all of these different factors end up actually playing a, a bit of a mind game and tricking the brain into thinking that there's a lot more there than there is. Because all it is is mud on a canvas. That's it. Uh, but we can somehow make it look like magic. And that's just down to knowing which bit does what. So I hope, I hope you've all kind of got browns um, and not not gone too confused because this is a fairly technical little bit. Does everybody, does anybody have any more questions about the brown? Can we take a two minute just to catch up? Yes, of course, of course. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, um, Kim. Thanks, Alex. Cool. Um, yeah, so 
so Kim, while we allow everyone to catch up, tell us about, I, you know, I know that you teach classes and I know that they're a little bit more advanced, um, not necessarily beginners classes, but like they're quite awesome. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, okay, well, what I, I don't actually teach um, normal classes anymore. I used to do one-on-one uh, -on -one classes and I used to teach, when I, many, many years ago in Nais and I used to even teach group classes. Um, I do still, but they're not beginner level because what I found is that I end up getting way too technical um, and the beginners just don't, um, they don't need that level of technical kind of, uh, I, I, I don't want to, yeah, I, I end up getting very nitty gritty. So like you've heard me talking about transparencies and the brush direction and all, like all of the factors that go into making the illusion of a painting. And what I do in my classes, um, which I've got the temerity to call master classes, um, I'm going to be doing one in the next month or so but I don't do them very often. Um, what I do is I'll take somebody's painting that they've already begun and I'll maybe get a group of about five, seven people together and I'll go over each painting with the person and then we'll, we'll work on it in the class together over the course of a day. So that's, that's pretty exhausting for beginners to spend a whole day painting. Um, I find people who are accustomed to painting can usually put in about four to six hours before exhaustion sets in, your brain starts dribbling out of your ears. But four to six hours is a good length of time to also look at other people's work while you're working on your own. So I do those and I will be doing one in the next month or so. Uh, if you just follow your yeah, on social media, it's my name. That's, that's really um, the, only, the only source for information is just have a look at my name. I am the same everywhere because it's a weird name. Um, and I, I, do, I do these master classes that kind of just get in depth on something that you're already busy with. And I'll, I'll sort of help people to level up and to get to the next level in their, in their particular skill set or with their particular medium. Oh, fantastic. Um, actually mentioning your name has reminded me to tell the audience a very important detail <laughs> of today's event. So we have two giveaway opportunities for you. One of them is happening in session. We'll be doing a randomizer wheel of names at the end of the session. So please stay until the end because you could possibly win yourself a paint and sip box into next month's paint and sip event. Um, and the other is a photo competition so if you take a photograph of what you're doing take a selfie take a photograph of your paint party um, and put it online tagging paint and sip ZA and tagging Kim Moby you can also win yourself a box into next month's paint and sip um, so thank you <laughs> Kim for reminding me because I realized I didn't say that in the beginning of the session <laughs> It's a pleasure. I'm, I'm really glad that you got, you got a, a, a chance to talk about these awesome, like, I, I, I want to kind of tell um, my friends and, and, and family about them, but I also, yeah, they, they need to buy tickets, dude, they need to buy tickets. Um, okay, so if, I, I'm hoping everybody's caught up. Um, do, enter the, do enter the drawers and the competitions and all of those things if you can. Um, and, and then share, share lots and lots and lots of stuff on social media because it does help an amazing organization to, to grow and to reach more people. Uh, I, I, I'm going to carry on with the next section, if that's okay with everybody, if I can just get a kind of a show of hands. Of, yeah, if any see thumbs up. I get one from Joanne, Fleur, Dorette, Janine and Chris. Okay, so, um, and then Eunice. Fantastic. I think we, we're set to go. Great. Okay. So what will have happened because of the way this painting is constructed, 
is that the horizon line ends up being about halfway through the painting, which makes it super convenient for us. When you're doing your own painting, you can move the horizon line along depending on what you feel moved by. What I'm going to do right now is we're going to talk, it, the, the, it says step five, the garden, but I'm pretty sure given what we've just done, that it's a good idea to move on to the sky. So I'm actually going to move on to the sky before I move on to the garden, because I want to let this ground section dry completely before we do anything lower down in the painting. The sky part is easy, but also not, uh, it's, it's simple, but it's not necessarily easy. I think that's, that's the best way to put it. What we're gonna do is some, oh, I've already got white on the palette. Look how, look how well my wine is working. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very efficient wine. Thanks, thanks, Alex. Um, so <laughs> Good. We're gonna clean brush, clean brush. We're gonna take some white and we're gonna try and mix that same idea of the sky blue, but with a little bit less blue. So it's gonna be a much lighter tone than the previous sky blue. I'm sure you can see the background compared to the blue that I've just mixed is actually very different. And we're gonna take this and quite thinly to begin with, we're gonna just start layering that in above the mountains. So try and get a clean crisp edge between your clouds and your mountains. The reason that that clean crisp edge matters so much is that it gives the sensation of depth. One of the things that the great masters of painting do is if you look at something like a John Singer Sargent or a Rembrandt, you will look at the edges a lot faster than you'll look at the soft transitions because the edges give you a sense of space. They give you a sense of distance. So your edges really matter. The neatness on your edges really, really matters because that is exactly what gives you the power of distance, of that cardboard cutout feeling. So what I'm doing here is I'm building up the base for some clouds. I'm not actually putting the clouds in wholesale. I'm building up a kind of a sensation of clouds with this clean edge. But I'm not putting them in just yet. I'm, I'm giving them a background and I'm, I'm sort of spreading that feeling out across the canvas so that it feels like the same sky across the whole canvas. Now sometimes skies will come from one side or the other and then you'll only do this on one side or the other but for this particular painting I really want a very equal even tone across the whole painting so I'm trying to keep everything very balanced. Now, you can keep adding patches of this using your mid-size brush. Make sure that you're using random strokes. So when you put the brush strokes down, don't do what, if you look at your screen right now, don't do this. Where you can see the brush, so they're, they're exactly the same. They're going across in the same direction. If you do that on a larger scale, it ends up looking either very over stylized or dead. So what you want to do to get a very naturalistic cloud is just kind of be random. It's if you imagine that squirrel from Ice Age on too much coffee, it's that kind of all over the place feeling of just nothing is in the same direction as the last stroke. And you end up with a very nice random texture and a very, very organic feel to the whole thing. Then what you're going to do is grab a little bit of that ground mixture that you have from this area here and mix it into just one side of the blue, just a little bit. Try not to let it overwhelm too much. But what you're going to do is you're warming that blue up with that brown texture, with that brown color. 
and then you're going to put that in other little random places. Now you want them to be about the same color or the same tone. So when you see these two next to each other, on the screen especially, you don't actually see that much difference. I know you can see quite a difference, well I can see quite a difference on my palette between the two. You should be able to see some difference there. But try and make sure that it's in patches and in little areas and not just randomly scattered. But your clouds are kind of, I still don't understand how, how clouds happen in a painting. I've been painting them for years and my best bet for getting a really good cloud is still make it random. Make it as random as you possibly can and then just make it light on the top and dark on the bottom. That is the best advice I can give you for really accurate clouds. Um, they are beautiful and mysterious and wonderful and we can stare at them for hours and the human mind is fascinated by clouds. Uh, I think that that is the reason I find them so difficult and I mean we just find them so fascinating. You can stare out of a window at clouds for days at a time and their endless variety and texture and all of that, the colors just, if I think if we could understand them and if, if I could explain them properly, they wouldn't be clouds, uh, which frustrates me because I have a very uh, sort of, I have a great love of logic and the fact that I can't explain why clouds work in the human mind the way that they do annoys me, but also I, I really do love it quite deeply. So we have, we have some slightly different tones, some slightly different textures, and the clouds kind of doing their own thing here. And now I want you to clean your brushes as well as you possibly can once you're, once you're happy with that. Don't do this until you're happy with that. And try and let it dry a little bit. So you don't want to be working in completely wet paint, but you also want that little moment of randomness, just a little bit of randomness because it ah, makes it so alive, it makes it so good. But once it's kind of just, just coming off to your touch, you can go in with pure, pure white and just go over the tops. Also with random strokes, sort of medium sized brush. But look at that, they come alive. I have no idea how this works. I wish I knew how this works, but it just works. Um, our, our brains are very hackable machines. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read any of Yuval Harari's books on, on um, humans and evolution. Um, it's called the one Homo Deus and the other one, oh, I can't remember the name of the other one, but our, our brains are amazing. What we're doing right now with just putting mud on a canvas, it's just mud. This is, this is taken out of sand dunes in um, PE. And this is taken out of other sort of earthworks. The umber means earth. It's, it's a kind of mud. Um, and what we're doing is we're putting these things on a canvas in a way that makes our brains think that there's something real there. So <laughs> we, it, it's, it's, to me, this is um, endlessly fascinating. I, I could spend the rest of my life just staring at landscapes and being completely lost. I probably will because that's my job, but you know. <laughs> Uh, so you're, you're feeling this sense of, of space and clouds and then to, to make them more unified, what you'll do is you'll take a white and blend it down into the blue with a slightly dry brush. So you can see how little paint I have on my brush right now. And what I'm doing is I'm dragging that white down into the gray so that there's not a sharp transition, it's a softer transition. Wherever you've got a sharp transition, there's a delineation of space. So you can tell that the top of the cloud 
and the sky are far apart from each other because it's such a clean line. And you can tell that the cloud and the rest of the cloud are kind of part of the same space because I've muddied them together. I've squished them into the same space. This also allows me to make one cloud sit in front of another. So I've got this cloud here, which is clearly sitting in front of this cloud here, which I will now make into its own thing. And you can have one cloud sit in front of another quite easily just by blending an edge and then by making an edge crisp. So you can see how much power you have just by manipulating edges. You can change the whole concept of space just by how soft or hard you make an edge. Um, I, I am curious to know if there are questions. Yes, <laughs> that was brain Bluetooth. We said that at the same time. <laughs> um, so <laughs> there is a question from Renata. Um, what did you use to give the clouds the darker shade? So the clouds have got a, a very neutral blue tone and then they have a slightly redder tone or a slightly warmer tone in them. So this is the blue and this is the warmer tone. What I did is I took the same tone that I mixed for the earth and I put a small, small, small amount into the blue. So I can do that again now. Um, I've mixed this light, lighter blue over here. And if I take a tiny amount of one of these browns that I've mixed for the bottom here, and I wanna make sure it's kind of a gray, browny blue. So you can see I've got a bit on my, on my brush there. I'll hold it over the white so you can really see. And I mix that into the blue. It warms it up. And that warms the blue enough to make a completely three-dimensional kind of shape. But at the same tonal value. So the light and dark part is the same, but you've added enough of a warmer brown. And I say warmer in a very foofy, artsy way because we don't have the vocabulary to really say what it is, which is that it's got uh, it's, it's at the different end of the light spectrum. Um, it's, it's got a, a longer wavelength. But you, what you're doing is you're just manipulating the light. So you're taking something that's going to make the light reflect differently. And you're putting it into something that, make, that, that makes the light reflect quite a short wave. And that makes the brain think that it's further. So red versus blue the red will always come to the foreground. The blue will always go to the background. Um, if you think about distant mountains and that sort of purpley blue, um, that's close to ultraviolet on the spectrum. That's a, that's a very extreme end of that wavelength. So the, the warm tone in short is just a little bit of red and a little bit of yellow. But yes, it's... Uh, it's the same blue as the sky, just a little bit lighter with some brown in. Is that, is that making sense? Mm, it, I, I think it does. Um, Janine and Chris ask, hi Kim, how did you use the pure white on the clouds again? Oh right, so I've got some on this side over here which I haven't done yet and I can demo it again. Um, I'm gonna just take pure white I should be using a clean brush, so I'm going to actually swap that out for a clean brush because I want to be a good example. I don't want to show you my bad habits. Um, so I'm using pure white here on a clean brush. And then you make the top edge of the cloud as crisp as you can. So you really want a clean edge on the top edge because that's where the light's striking. That's where all of the, the kind of energy happens. That's the difference between background and foreground. That's, that's where the light hits. That's where the cloud ends. And then once you've got your nice, clear, crisp edge on the top, you soften it down and you kind of smoosh it in, like a squishy, smooshy, schmoogle thing. And that blends the highlight in with the cloud itself. And you can add another highlight inside the cloud because they are lumpy as entities. They do kind of 
have this wonderful randomness to them. Um, try to take little breaks in between to observe what you've done so far. So try not to let yourself go onto autopilot too much because it's very easy to start painting and then just be on autopilot and keep painting. And the next thing you know, something that was magical has kind of turned into a Disney cartoon. Um, not that there's anything wrong with Disney magic, it's just that this is not what I'm going for um, at the moment. This, I wanna try and make it look as natural as possible and as, as real as possible. So the soft, soft bottom, crisp top is, is kind of the trick for these types of clouds built up over the mountains. Does that answer your question? I think, I think it does. I think your clouds look absolutely amazing. I'd love to see everyone else's clouds and, um, and see where everyone yeah. else is at. Do you feel comfortable going into gallery view there on your yeah, side? Yeah, let's do that. You do? Okay, great. If everyone can put your, your paintings up to the camera, just so that Kim can take a look and see where you're at and she might be able to give some advice because she's now able to see what you're doing. Lovely. Okay, so I see um, quite a few. Uh, can you see on your side, Kim? I see them down the side. Um, yeah, uh, Sarah, if you could lift your painting up a little, I can't see the bottom of it. Okay, fabulous. Yeah, that's looking great. Yeah. Yeah, these are looking good. These are looking very good. Wow. The hey, this whole so thing good. works, guys. <laughs> nice. Wow. Direct, nicely done. Yeah, these are good. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing any anything that I need to address at all, really. These are good, good clouds. They look like clouds. Well done. <laughs> Clouds look like nice Yay! <laughs> they as a t-shirt, oh. guys. Well done. Um, so um, I'm going to let you um, keep going with the clouds. When we, we yeah, when we, I'm, I'm going to quickly take a little break, and then when I come back, I'm going to climb back into the vines themselves. So um, if you could all just, once you're kind of happy with your clouds, maybe just put your hand up and then sit back and have some good old vino or cup of tea or whatever you happen to have to hand. And then um, as soon as everybody's hands are up, I will go on to the next section. So you can actually raise your hand um, or like if at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you have reactions. So you can use the thumbs up reaction once you're ready to move on. Um, or in the participant section under your name, if you press more, um, I believe it says raise hand. So you can do that too. While um, Kim's just taking a two minute break. But crank that music, get some wine. She'll be back shortly.
Lovely. You are back. There's a lot of people in the chat bar that are saying the clouds are challenging. And I, I suppose that is one of the more challenging aspects of yeah, um, the, the clouds are definitely the hardest part of pretty much any painting that you do. Um, if you are struggling with the clouds, that is because you are painting clouds. Um, that is my fault for choosing clouds. <laughs> no, Al's iPad. Um, I'm not sure who this who that is, but your clouds look awesome. Wow, fantastic. She's got like really quite nice, um, you know, quite thick, deep clouds where you can see that nice contrast between the white and um, those three other colors. Looking oh, those are beautiful, yes. Wow. Yeah. I think those are called cumulonimbus. I think you actually just nailed cumulonimbus. I can't even pronounce it, but there's a, there's a proper geo, like a, a meteorological thing for those clouds that sort of stack up on one another. I think, I think you got them. That's beautiful. <laughs> well done, Al's iPad. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I, from what I can see, everybody has really good clouds. I mean, clouds are different everywhere in the world. You never end up with the same set of clouds anywhere. They, they're like snowflakes have got nothing on clouds. I see Renata's clouds look lovely. They if look like bright and wispy. Nice. Yeah, if you are struggling at all with clouds, the only thing I would say is make them more random. Just make them more random. Your your biggest thing with clouds to remember is how they're actually built which is puffs of steam going in every direction with an edge mm. yeah it's it's the most random thing in the world and it's just literally light hitting puffs of water mm -hmm. so random is good light on top bottom on dark on the bottom random everywhere else Okay, so now that I can see most of you, um, just by a show of hands and thumbs up, are you ready to move on from the clouds? Can we go on to the next step? Yes, all right. We have a lot of people that are saying, yes, let's go. Okay, great. So the next step, we're just gonna go straight into the vineyards. So that's this part here, this yellow area that we've got so far. Um, I'm going to suggest that we use, you can, if you want to make it a spring vineyard and go for acid green, like a really strong acid green. I'm going for autumn and for warm tones here because we've got such cool tones in the sky and green in the middle. So I feel like it balances out quite nicely, but that is your call. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna mix the red and the yellow together and you can add a small amount of the gray to some parts and you can add a small amount of white to other parts. Um, I'm gonna start off with a sort of a, a darker, ugly mix. So you can see on my brush, I've got an ugly mix. If you pause and look at the, the, the brush that I've made here, it is a little bit of red, a little bit of gray, a little bit of yellow. And then what I'm gonna do is sort of press my brush down and then Pull it off in a random direction and press my brush down and pull it off in a random direction and I'm going to just try to build up shapes here quite slowly I'm not going to rush but I'm going to try to build up so here we've got one vine coming down I can I can sort of imagine one vine coming down there I'm going to do another one at the quarter mark there and just build up leaf shapes. The nice thing about having filled in the background is that we don't have to worry about leaving gaps because those gaps actually fill themselves in. But this part is quite meditative. It's quite a, a, a slow meditation. Don't overfill it. Use your brush quite slowly and add and remove colors as it sort of hits you. And as it builds up, you'll get much more of a sense of what it should be doing. 
So you'll see with what I'm doing here, it's sort of very slowly building up. Now this is usually the part of the painting that I come back to the most often. So what I'm going to suggest is that you build up the first layer and then assume that you're going to come back to it. So don't try and get it perfect in the first pass. You're going to have extra bits that you're going to want to come back and work on. Okay, so we have quite a few questions coming in now. And one yes. of them is, the vineyards are red, yellow, and? So basically start with just your red and your yellow and add a little bit of the gray if you feel like you want some dark. Add a little bit of white if you feel like you want some light. But it's just the gray added or just the white added and then your, your primary two colors are yellow over here and red. Great. And then um, Diana and Susan ask, so are these the leaves that you're painting? Yes, these are the leaves on the vines. Okay, fantastic. And then they want to do green leaves. So how do they do yes. that? So to do green leaves, what you're probably going to need is a teeny, teeny bit of this blue here. I'm going to mix up a demo. Um, I'll probably just paint it in a little of this white because this is a white surface. So you get a very crisp, clean idea of what's going on. Please ignore me using a slightly dirty brush going into the yellow. It's a bad habit. Don't do it. Um, and then move, mixing that blue in with the with the yellow, you'll end up with this amazing acid green because thalo blue is so powerful, it actually can just take over really, really easily. Um, I would, if you are curious about it, do it in person because I'm not sure that the, the screen is conveying how truly acid green this, this can become. Um, and then use that acid green in combination with the gray. So I can probably put a leaf or two in here of this color here because it could be early autumn. Um, autumn does happen over a period of time and there's yellow and orange mixed in with the green. And so are you just um, at this stage just sporadically putting in textured marks of this color, quite That's randomly. Exactly it. Okay. That's exactly it. It's very much about laying in a foundation of sort of textured foliage that you can then slowly go back in and build on. But this, as I said, is the area of this particular painting that I always go back to and fiddle and fiddle and fiddle and fiddle and fiddle for weeks. Because there's always one more leaf or just one more little little highlight that I can add or just a little bit extra that I can put onto a branch or onto a stick. So do feel um, completely free to do anything you want at this stage because this is your foundation. This is not your final. Fantastic. Okay. Okay, so while um, we are, what was the word you used? Meditatively, <laughs> I feel like I said that wrong. Exactly, yes. Um, um, going ahead with our texture. Um, how did COVID impact your work, Kim? Um, like, you know, I know it's a dreary topic and I know we're trying to like move away from it. But, um, it's, it's, it's a very important thought though because I think that it's it's not it's not isolated to any one group of individuals we're all going through some flavor of this madness together yeah. um, and for artists um, I think it's, it's it's quite a different experience from people who have what might be considered regular jobs because we are very much on the fringes of the economy, especially as far as fundraising and government are concerned. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the a lot of the funds that were um, nobly, very very nobly given 
to banks and to the Solidarity Fund have been handed out to organizations and to artists as loans. I'm not quite sure who is supposed to get the interest from these loans, but having applied for a Solidarity Fund loan um, and been rejected along with about two, three hundred other people who I can name and several thousand who I can't. Um, there are a couple of very good Facebook and um, social media groups that are pursuing that. It's, it's been very interesting that um, we're, we're sort of not just sidelined, but also expected to buy the idea that a loan is a reasonable thing to come from a donation. Um, it's, it's, it's producing some very interesting questions. And I think a lot of our structures as art institutions and as individuals are getting a lot of very good questions now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, just to revert to a question uh, that okay, we have. We, so the vines that are coming out into the road, um, I mean, are, how many of those are you going to be putting into the painting? I see like a few, there's two sections where the, uh, I think the vines are like sort of coming out into the road and I think that's trying to give the impression of it. So I'm going to revert to the first picture here um, because I think that maybe gives a better indication of where we're going. It starts off with this and slowly progresses through layers of, of color until we end up with this in the front. So the, the number I'd say in very practical terms is two, but it, it does recede over the distance. So if you're looking at your screen, we're gonna do, we're gonna do one, it comes down here-ish. Um, I'm probably on this particular painting because I've already started it. I'm going to do one that comes down here and one that comes down here. So I'll do three on this. There is just I'm, I'm two. Not sure. How do I make cream? Brown and yellow. How do I make? Green. Hi. Oh, green. green is brown oh, and yellow. No, yeah. green is blue and yellow. Oh my word. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, so between blue, this beautiful fallow blue, and yeah. this lovely uh, arillamide yellow, I think it is, or lemon yellow, um, you, you mix those two together and you end up with a green. So I'll do it again on the little bit of white so that yeah, you can got it. You. There's that and then there's a little bit of blue. Louise, Tiny you amount of blue. I use a lot of blue. And then you mix that together and you get green. It's a kind of magic chemistry with light. Pretty, pretty amazing. Yes, you were going to say there's another question. Um, no, I was just trying to establish if um, Louise had another question. Oh, okay. I think, yeah, I think it's okay. Okay, cool. Well, while we're on the subject of green, because these vines are going to be a thing that I'm going to keep adding to throughout the rest of the session, um, I'm going to suggest that you start thinking about these trees in the background here. You're gonna use a lot of green for that. So knowing how to mix the green is important. The blue and the yellow together make a very nice green, but because we're using a Dala paint, which is very naturally quite translucent, um, it, has, it has wonderful qualities when you're using thin layers. It can be a little bit difficult to build up. Um, the different brands have different qualities. So some brands like Memore is, is quite opaque. It's known for being very opaque. 
Um, Dala has a lot of translucency to it. Winsor & Newton has a mix of the two depending on the pigment. But if you mix a little bit of white into any color that you've made, it's going to become two things. It's going to become a little colder. It's going to feel cooler, which means that it's shorter on the light spectrum. It's also going to become more opaque, which means you can't see what's behind it as easily. So I've now mixed a very neutral sort of green on this. On my screen, it looks a little bit too gray, but in person, it is a proper green. And I'm gonna start laying that in as a background for trees. I can also pop a little bit of it into my vineyard. I'm gonna try and keep my vineyard more oranges. But we can start to just place the color where those trees are behind the buildings and let that layer dry. So while you're doing the vineyard, think about where your trees are going to go behind here and maybe start mixing some greens and, and playing with that area a little bit and just filling in that color. So we don't have any white canvas left. I want to make sure that all of the white canvas is covered. If not with exactly the color that we're going to end with, then at least with something that will pass while we're working or will give us a good background to work on in future. Because the wonderful thing about these lessons is that they are actually uh, digital. So they're forever and ever and ever and ever. Which means if I say the wrong thing, you can laugh at me forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just place the greens for my background here. And then we can build up over that. As I, as I said before, try not to make it too thick because in this cold weather, it does take a while to dry. We just have a have a structure in that background that you can then build on. And then I'm going to go straight back to my vineyards again, because while that dries, I've actually got a little bit of uh, spare time to just work on the vineyard. If anybody has questions while we're doing this, I will be very happy to answer. Mm, it looks, it looks good. It looks good. Everyone's making such amazing progress. I think at this stage, the painting's really coming to life. You know, yeah, I must say, I'm very impressed with the medium and, and with the, the whole way that this is set up because I don't think I've ever seen such good results. Um, even in live sessions where I'm walking table to table, I don't think I've ever had this kind of really, really just solidly good result. So well done to everybody, but also just like, thanks, Alex, because this is a really, really, and Steve, who's not here at the moment, but you guys are amazing. <laughs> oh, thanks. Well, you had to do what we had to do, what we had to do. And everyone was so excited about like paint and sip. And I think, you know, we had our last in-person event on the night of the lockdown announcement. Like that was the last day. <laughs> My heart <laughs> broke. I know it was, it was, um, sure. and it was huge. It was at the Aria. There were like, you know, close to 200 people oh in that session. And it then it's we so were, emotional though. I know it was, no, it was emotional. There was, yeah. We cried <laughs> because most of our funding comes from um, in-person, you know, socially conscious events and right. team builds and corporate gatherings. And yeah. um, we took such a significant knock. And then we thought, oh. well, whilst yeah. everyone's now going, you know, moving into this online world, how can we try and adapt painting stuff as well? And this has actually really proven to be something quite special. I mean, it's not as, you know, I suppose like you're never going to get the level of connection as you would in an in-person event, 
But I think if you create your own space um, and you invite some of your friends over, you have your own little independent paint parties, or even if you just want to spend some time and relax and, and, um, and just create an amazing piece of art in your own space, I think mm. this is absolutely perfect. I think, as you said, with the, with the groups, like if you've got a small group of friends together and you're doing this as an online class, there's a different kind of intimacy. Hmm. Um, because I've had Zoom chats with my friends recently that are very different from what you'd have if you were going out for dinner together. There's a, there's a different type of intimacy. There's a different type of... Um, you, you have to be vulnerable with each other in a much more... Um, obvious way and that that sets you up to kind of really show up for people in a very different way than we're used to so I think there's a different there's a different energy to it but I think it can actually even be more than what we have in an in-person event where you're in the same room with a bunch of strangers yeah yeah and you exactly. can't actually share deeply personal stuff you can hear you can kind of be in the moment and then just briefly mute and say something very very kind of close to you or you can you can type in a personal chat to the to the organizer of the event without having to put your hand up in a group yeah exactly this, um, this you're able to connection that i don't think you can achieve any other way that's true because you're in your own space and you feel super yeah. comfortable you don't have to get out your pajamas <laughs> <laughs> That you is know, a sort of roll out of bed on a Sunday and say, I'm going to make a cup of coffee and I'm going to get ready to paint. And you don't have to show your camera. You just have to like show up and get creative. And I think, you know, I think um, these online events are very special in their own right. Um, mm. I, again, I really miss the in-person events and I hope that at some point we are able maybe to do both. That would be awesome. That would be perfect. For those that prefer. It would be such a perfect mix. Yeah, exactly. Or a hybrid where we do an yeah. event and we also have the online, you know, variable where you can either come to the in-person event if that's what you prefer. But if you want to just hang out in your pajamas at home, you can still mm -hmm. see what's happening online. So that's... Exactly. That's yeah. Really yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd enjoy that because... You know, every now and then, you, you kind of, I mean, my life basically, I live in my pajamas. So to kind of get out of bed and have this art experience where you're kind of doing exactly what I'm doing. Sorry, can, can you yes, just explain how you, what you're doing with those colors on the trees? Right. So what I've done is I've taken some colors from the vineyards and I'm slowly letting them become highlights for the trees. Without, without doing too much, I'm doing very, very tiny amounts of those colors blending into the trees. Just to tie them together. Does that make sense? So I'm using a tiny amount of this, this color that I've mixed for the vineyards, which is over here. And then I'm, I'm just putting them as, as like little dots inside the tree area. Thanks for asking, um, Diana. Yeah, that's a good, I, I was getting carried away with the conversation. Yeah, yeah well, that's, that's so interesting. interesting okay. we, we also, you know, we want to keep it like interactive and still yeah. kind of chat that's and good. learn about one another. But um, mm. if you have a question, pop your mic on and feel free to ask. That's awesome. Thanks I so much. I do. I do, Kim. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi, it's Louise. Hello. So I'm just wondering why... Um, all the red and the yellow, forgive me, I'm not an artist, on a green and light green vineyard. How do you mix those colors? How do you get that mix right? Um, you've got, it is you've a, got a lot of red. Hey? Um, it, do you want to hold your Louise, you say? I'm going to yes. just scroll yeah. through everybody and yeah. try and find you. Do you want to hold it up to the screen for me? Um, can you see that? Um, I'm just trying to find you um, in the group. Just lots of hills, clouds, and a very red vineyard, which is... Um... Oh, Louise, your camera isn't on. We can hear you speaking very clearly, but we can't see your... There you go. Now? There you go. That's it. 
That's it. Can you see, Kim? I can see it back uh, here. Oh, there we go. Yes, I can see it. Okay. Uh, do you think you could put your painting a little closer to the camera, Louise? Yeah. So I'm kind of like, I've got all of this red at the bottom and I'm just wondering now how. You can raise your canvas can. up or lower your, lower your um, camera a little bit. Like oh, that. right. So what's happened there is you've got beautiful, beautiful green in the hills, but you have still plain yellow for the vineyards. Yeah. Right. So what you're going to do is you're going to mix a little bit more yellow and red together, and you're going to splodge it over that yellow area. So okay, and that will get the vineyard sort of yeah, brownie brownie red sort of bricky tones. If you if you imagine bricks, um, yeah, on a brick house, you're going to take those and you're going to just splodge them over that yellow area. So this over here, this triangle that you can see on my screen would be I can. yeah that that would be the yellow that you have at the moment. But what I've done is I've splodged yellow, red, and um, a little bit of green into that in a very random way. So it is, it is a little bit technical in that it is very random. And you have to be um, quite light with your touch. So start putting the paint in, see what it does, and then adjust. So you right. want to make it lighter okay. or darker, depending on how it responds. Once you've, once you've picked up the paint on your brush and squished it down, that, that gives you a read on, on what you're going to do next. Is it going to be lighter? Is it going to be darker? Are you going to continue in different areas the same way? Okay. Um, what you want to do is you want to just fill that area up with oranges and let a little bit of the yellow show through. Okay. Yeah, no, it does. No, it does. No, thanks for that. No, absolutely. Great. I just felt I had too much red. Um, so if, if okay. you could hold your camera up to your canvas again and just make sure I can see the bottom because I can only see the heels. I can't actually see the bottom of your canvas. No? That's better. That's, that's, I'm, I'm still seeing mostly heels. If you just tilt, tilt the camera a little bit, that's perfect. There we go. No, now I'm just seeing the top of the canvas. Tilt it back down again. There we go. Okay. Um, your edge between the soil and the yellow is too tidy. It's okay. too tidy. So if you can just make your, your greens blend down, your browns blend up, and then try and put some splodges in for the vineyard that's really going to make a huge difference to it feeling like a landscape. Okay. So and then I'd, what I'd suggest is you have your, you have your horizon line in the middle, right? Yeah. Okay. So take your oranges. You're going to make an orange and you're going to splodge the orange with a little bit of white in it across the yellow, cover the yellow as much as you can and splodge okay. it down into the brown. Okay. And just fill that area up. And then when you're done, if you can raise your hand again, I'll come back to you. Cool. Okay. Like make, make, right. lots, make lots happen there. Okay. I'll do that. Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay. I'll chat okay. you in a bit. Okay. Thanks. There is, there is uh -huh. someone that Thanks. raised their hand. Um, Kim, Shirley raised her hand. I don't know. If yes. You, Shirley, would you like to um, show your... Hi. Um, Hi, Shirley. <laughs> right, you need more. Yeah. The, 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 the word that you need is more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Just more. <laughs> You're doing beautifully, just more. Thank you. Okay, great. Can I ask? <laughs> Do it. Yes, is mine okay? Um, it's a little bit of shade. I don't know if you can just turn it slightly more towards your face. There we go. I've got better light on it now. Um, yeah, this is, this is lovely. Um, I would say the same thing as to Shirley is that perhaps a little bit more and perhaps a little bit more random. So what you want is little splodges of color. You don't necessarily want them all dotted uniformly over everything. 
You want to okay. clumps, if that makes Thank sense. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Okay. It um, needs to look a little bit like a badly mixed carrot cake. <laughs> Elle's iPad is holding her painting up, Kim. I, yes. I personally think that it's fine. It's awesome, but I mean, I'm not the artist. <laughs> no, that is lovely. Um, what I can see you might be struggling with is that your trees um, above the horizon line are quite light in color. So um, what I'd suggest is taking that same sort of textured approach that you've had through the rest of the painting and using more of the gray, maybe adding some yellow to that gray color so that you've got a richer green and then just deepening that deepening in splodges, deepening the color there. So I'm going to go into those trees now, actually, and I'll give you guys some detail in that. Um, wonderfully, you can play this back if you get lost. Mm. So I'm actually just going to climb in there and, um, and, and start um, explaining how that works. Kim, Kim, sorry, from Sarah and I. Yes. Is saying mine looks super dotty. Is it okay with the yellow showing through? Too much or too little? Okay, so um, let me give me the name of this question again. Who's, who's um, this? Her, her name is Sarah Knight, and she's put the question into the chat bar. Oh, there we go. I see. Reading. Oh, can you okay, see? Okay, so what I was saying about clumps before. So, you know, when you're trying to clean out a coffee container and it's got kind of clumps of coffee in it, you want to try and put your paint in clumps. You know, make it, make it really kind of all of the yellows in one little spot and all of the yellow, the, the reds in one little spot. And then you kind of let them mess out from there. But if you spread them out too evenly, you end up with the dotty look. There is, it, it's, not a, it's not a bad look. There's a very good artist called Georges Sua, um, who was called, he, he did pointillism. Um, if you look him up, you'll, you'll see a lot of the, the dotty look, but that's from a very evenly spread uniform dot. So what you want to try and do is take all of those uniformly spread dots and clump them. So, so should I um, blend them a bit more? A, a sort of the opposite of blend. Um. So you want to do the opposite of blend. So um, I'm going to just show you on... Um, I'm going to show you on the apron because it's a nice white surface. So what you want to do is, I'm going to do it with green, but it doesn't really matter. You kind of make a, a, a smoochy mess in one little area and you mm. make a smoochy kind of mess in another little area. And then you kind of let them join, but randomly. Because what you've got right now is a very uniform yeah. darkness going like that. Too organized. <laughs> it's, it's actually too organized. Yeah. So what you need is more splodge. So I'll just keep going. <laughs> just keep going, but try and get, uh, this is a very technical term, but more splodge. <laughs> I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so Thank you. I think um, <laughs> Shirley Sandy has her, her hand raised as well. Yes. Shirley, pop your mic on and let us know what your question is. Sorry, I just still had my hand raised from last time. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. okay, it looks like we can move on to that. Um, okay, great. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start doing some lighter and darker sections on the trees. So much like the cloud, your top edge is lighter because the sun is hitting it. And much like the cloud, your bottom edge is darker because the sun is not hitting it. So to get to that idea of darkening the green, I'm going to make a green here. Um, I'll just make it over here. So quite an acid green. Maybe a little bit more blue in there. This blue is a bully. Um, it does tend to take over quite a lot, but it is glorious because it is so much power. Um, 
so you've got this green and then you want to make shadows underneath at the bottom of the trees because if you look at a tree in nature the bottom is just so much more percentage wise in shade so you're going to take some of that gray that you made in the beginning and you can mix that in with a little bit of the green and you end up with this lovely deep forest shade and you place that near the bottom in little splodges. Splodge is a technical term. I swear it has got to be a technical term because it's just such a useful word. So try not to make it too evenly spread. You want that randomness that you had in the clouds. And you want like one little random spot just, just there for no particular reason because nature does that. Uh, it's, it's one of the reasons that I find landscapes so infinitely complicated and intimidating is the, the, the randomness of it. The fact that you're looking at so many different things interacting with each other. Now, what I would say is that your horizon line needs to be quite clean. So you could almost do what I'm doing right now and just drag a line across parts of it just to keep it really super clean because those crisp lines tell the eye, they cheat the eye and they tell the eye that this is an edge, this is an ending. There is something behind and something in front of and then your brain has to fill in the gaps. But I would say just fill in these really random little sections of shadow and light over those trees. More dark towards the bottom, more light towards the top. And you will end up with something that approximates nature enough for your eyes to lie to you. If you want to differentiate the trees from each other, you can make one particular area that much darker. So what I'm gonna do here, so I'm gonna pretend this over here is a different tree and I'm gonna use a much darker shade to just line under this area. And you can see how that suddenly that becomes a different tree that becomes a different group of trees in fact just because i've changed the tonal value of that area um, over here i'm going to use this to make a sort of a foresty area i'm going to drag this down because it's going to mimic the shapes of the trees and we're not too worried about spatial uh, they call it foreshortening, which is a, a lovely sounding word. Foreshortening. It sounds like a kind of biscuit. The, um, the trees here are very vertical. I think that there are cedars, or pines of some sort, but they're very, very vertical. And then you can mix in a little bit of the lighter greens and just make some highlights in there. Amongst, amongst the dark, you can sort of just add a little bit of texture and, um, and tone. I'm going to darken behind and under this tree as well. and then all the way down to the horizon. I am possibly going to leave the buildings out of this particular painting. Um, if anybody is very enamored of the buildings, I will show you how to do them. Um, they're, not, they're not essential to the overall painting if you want to just focus on the texture of the foliage and the plants because this is quite a good landscape just as it is um, as far as focal points and 
points of interest go. Um, does anybody desperately want to see what the buildings look like? Because I can put them in for you briefly. Okay, I see. I see a few hands going up there. Great. Okay, so let us do these buildings then. What we're going to start with is the grey. We're, we're, we're going to take a little lump of the grey and try and move it away from all of the other colours so it's got a little bit of independence. And then a little lump of white and we're going to mix a fairly cool neutral grey tone. Now mine is still a little bit too warm for my liking. The reason I want it to be cold is because the walls, if they're white walls, they tend to reflect the color of the sky. So you'll see around sunset, if the sky is blue, that the shadows are blue. But when the sky starts to turn to different colors, the shadows actually reflect the color of the sky, which is the most astonishing thing to me because it's, it just, how, how can you end up with that color just happening in a shadow. It's, it's got to go through so many different things to become that shadow in, in the world, in the atmosphere, in the, uh, in the space between us and the sun. It's just, wow, how does, how does it do that? So looking at the original picture here, I'm going to just lay these shapes in very, very simply. They're basically just a bunch of oblongs in this sort of gray blue color. And you want your edges to be super clean. One of the tricks to doing these buildings is that the edges are clean, 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 clean. So you don't want splodges, you don't want shuffling, you don't want mind changing. And when you lay the roof in, make your mind up about the direction it's going to go in and stick with it. Try not to change your mind too much. If you have any errors, because it is in the middle of a forest, you can cover stuff up with trees. But you want the edges that you do leave out to be super clean because that is going to differentiate the house from the background. And there is one more rule about perspective that I'm going to tell you in this painting, because this is not a painting about perspective. This is a painting about textures. But if you have a diagonal, all the diagonals are the same. So, if you're going in this direction, that one has to be in the same direction. Those two have to match up, absolutely have to match up. Otherwise your building is going to look wonky. If you have a vertical, it is vertical. So you don't do that, you don't do that. If it is vertical, it is absolutely vertical. If you have a horizontal, make sure all of your horizontals are going in the same direction for the same buildings. Otherwise they're going to recede like a Picasso painting in any direction. And although there is a huge amount of validity in everything that Picasso discusses in his paintings, that's not what I'm going for here. This is a very um, naturalistic looking, slightly impressionistic looking painting. So what you'll see here is that I'm matching that angle and that angle. So the roof and the roof are on the same page. I'm going to make this edge here reflect pure sunlight. So that is going to be at the same angle as that. But this edge of the building with its perfect vertical is going to be hit by sunlight directly. And I don't know if you can see that coming alive, but there's something magical at the moment when that 
starts to come alive. And then you just slow down, go back, check that your angle is right. Come back and check that your angle is right. And then come back and check that your angle is right because your angle is almost never going to be perfect on the first try. But when you do get it right, it feels like a superpower. I created reality here on my little canvas. I did it. I did the magic thing. So for the roof, I'm going to make it slightly darker. Not a whole lot darker because I don't want it to disappear into the background, but just slightly darker. And I can actually make it a little bit bluer because I want it to reflect even more of the sky. But as if it were a darker substance. So we're imagining a slate gray blue for this roof. Let me just drag it across there. Those edges are so super important. I don't know if you can see how I messed that edge up, but it does ruin the roof line if I don't get the edge right. So you can see that splodgy, squidgy edge just doesn't cut it. I have to, have to, have to have a crisp edge if I want the roof line to read correctly. And the building is not white. The building is the color of the sky plus shadow. The white is just incidental to how bright or dark that is. Um, so there's the edge of my building under the roof. Um, Alex, do we have any more questions? No, nope, not at this stage. Not in okay. the chat bar, anyway. Clearly given everybody quite enough to be doing. <laughs> yeah. I think that, um, yeah, I think that everyone's, you know, focusing on getting those edges straight. Good, good, good. Um, but maybe might need just a little bit of time to catch up, I think. Yeah, and well then. That everything is, um, is good where it's at. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask us at any point. I'm going to ask Kim another question about her. Um, but, you know, please never feel worried about um, interrupting and, 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 you know, putting up your painting and asking us questions. Um, so, Kim, where do you see your, um, where do you see your work going from here? You know, it's sort of like post COVID and do you have any exciting things lined up? So, yeah, I've, I had a lot of exciting things lined up and then this year happened and it was quite an interesting experience. But um, I'm, I'm moving towards doing some more of these masterclass type of things. Mm -hmm. uh, I may be going to live in Dubai for a little bit, um, looking at residencies wow. and I've got a few invitations. There's one in a gallery in The Hague that I might go and stay um, in Holland for about three months, um, which is a delight because I will probably paint for about half of that and spend the rest of the time in the Rijksmuseum. Uh, <laughs> because it's just the best. Oh, it was, it was amazing. Um, the, yeah, I think from here, the main 
the main thing for me to do is just really to to find a way to keep painting and to keep sculpting and to keep to keep doing this weird and wonderful thing uh, there are so many ways that the world is opening up now more than it ever has yeah. so I think that for me it's about keeping an eye on what what's going on what's possible what's what what i am able to to follow yeah. um, there were a lot of things i wanted to do before all of this hit that were impossible but suddenly are incredibly easy um especially in the direction of my printmaking uh that's become because of the because of the lockdowns and because of everybody kind of struggling to move things across borders the, um, the printmaking has become super interesting and super important and copyright has changed drastically because of the way that um, the, all, of the, all of the different medicines are being handled across borders. Um, there's a wonderful organization called the Intellectual Property Organization or the World Intellectual Property Organization based out of Geneva in Swe uh, Switzerland, in Sweden. Switzerland. Um, and they have, um, they've, they've been quite instrumental in opening up a lot of these copyrights so that they're publicly accessible. And uh, so there's, there's some very, very exciting stuff happening in the open source world as far as art goes and as far as moving away from the old fashioned gallery or agent system goes. Um, I've, I've got a few essays on my website and there are definitely about, they're about, yeah, there, there, there are three articles that we're busy completing at the moment. And then there, there are more to come about the, just the way that the art world has operated up till now and how it's busy changing, which I'm also involved in a discussion with a group in, uh, mostly in Joburg, but uh, a couple of people in America, I think there's one in Japan. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't know where he is at the moment. Um, but we're, we're discussing how artists are moving forward from, from all of this because everybody lost their mind at the same time. And it's, it's the first time in a very, very long time that that's happened. So we've, we've got some very interesting results from that that are ongoing. Mm. Sure, it's, um, it's a whole other world, you know. I mean, I haven't ever thought about how artists must be so, you know, vastly impacted by COVID and you can't exactly exhibit your art anymore. And I think the, you know, prints make the most sense. And then you start thinking about copywriting and how like, as soon as you put art into onto the interweb, for instance, how dangerous that might be. And someone else yeah. might like that work and put it onto a t-shirt and, you know, put it into these like mass printed pillowcases or whatever that you find in, um, yeah. you know, sometimes when you find in, I don't know, your sort of wholesale furniture stores. So um, that's really interesting. How yeah. does, um, how like, can, can, can you give me a little insight in how that works? Like, how does one protect that their the whole world? Artwork? That is a whole, this is an amazing, dark, um, steamy, uh, scandalous world. Um, so Woolworths, a couple of years ago, actually got into trouble for taking art um, that somebody had put into one of the, I, I don't know if anybody remembers those Woolworths bags that you used to be able to get with art on them. Uh, there was a controversy and they actually ended up stopping it because what they'd done is that they'd, they'd sneakily written stuff into the contract and then tried to copy the work of the artist behind their back without explicit permission and without giving the artist any compensation. So that ended up having a knock-on effect on other artists that was negative. But overall, um, it is very necessary to protect copyright and to protect the artists in general um, because what happens is there's currently a bit of a controversy about a particular gallery that was taking artists to work without written permission 
uh, making scans and saying that because they'd paid for the scans that they owned the artwork and that they were able to reproduce it as much as they wanted. Which has a fair number of people very irate. Um, it's also disingenuous to the collectors because the collectors believe that they're buying a genuine artwork. It's never been signed by the artist, it's never been seen by the artist and there's no record of it anywhere. Which means that if they try to sell the work and the buyer tries to find out, you know, where the work has been, what, what is the, the word is provenance, um, which is a fancy schmancy Frenchy way of saying the way that it's approved, the way that it has been proven. So the, the, the proof of the pudding, so to speak, uh, but in French, obviously, because the art world. So, yeah. 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 Um, so what happens is that these artworks that are not actual artworks because they've never been seen or approved by the artist go out into the world and the artist never makes the sale, never sees any profit from it. The buyer ends up with a worthless piece because there's no record of it anywhere. And everybody except the fraudster who walks away with the money is... Uh, much the worse for wear. So there's a lot to be said for artists physically signing their own work. Mm. Um, if, you, if you're selling work, try to make sure that you've had your physical hands on it. If you have digital copies of your work, make sure that nobody else has access to those digital copies. And if they do, make sure that the contracts are extremely, extremely weighted in your favor. It's always worth paying a little extra for a lawyer rather than losing money over the longer term. Um, and then also keeping a record of every single thing that's sold. So if you're selling prints of your work, um, if, you, if you are formally, or if you know somebody who's an artist who is formally selling prints of their work, try to make sure that they have a photograph of their signature on each print. Just a photograph, that's enough. It just has to be on a hard drive somewhere in the studio traceable to that date. It doesn't have to be in a database with all of the key tags or anything super fancy. It's, it's just a matter of having that record because that protects the artist and protects the buyer from unscrupulous dealers who would quite literally try to, to make a fortune at the expense of the artist. Mm. It's a lot to think about. Um, we do have um, a question, just to uh, clarify again, what are the colours for the building? Um, so the building is mostly made of the sky colours. Because what happens with white, with white paint, is that it reflects extremely well. And what you're going to find is that most of the white paint is actually reflecting blue. So especially in the shadows, where you don't have direct sunlight on it. So here, for example, there's no direct sunlight on it, but it's reflecting some kind of light. And the only light that's landing on it is the light from the sky, landing directly on that, and then shooting straight out into your eyeball. So what you're gonna have is basically almost perfect sky blue on the side of the building that isn't hit by sunlight. And then on the side of the building that is hit by sunlight, you're going to have a sort of a, a slightly mudgy, smudgy, Pure, pure-ish white. But what you want to do is be very, very careful about how much pure white you ever use in a painting because it's so powerful that you want to just keep it for the highlights, for the important edges, and to kind of scuff across surfaces to make them kind of sparkle. Um, just by a show of hands, who is ready to go on to the next step as everyone's buildings in? Yep. Got a few people that are ready. Buildings are done, trees are done. Great. So I'm gonna move on to these uprights. And then because this is a kind of ongoing-ish project, um, I'm going to say that what one should do is, if, if you've got the uprights in, keep going on the vines, keep going on the, on the, the texture of the plants and just more and more and more fine detail on those, those parts. Um, your clouds, from what I could see, are actually gorgeous. 
So I wouldn't suggest that anybody actually touches the clouds again. Um, I was very, very impressed with the clouds. I'd say try and take that same technique and concept from the clouds and put it into the vines because that is, that is your basic um, structure of the vine as well. You've got the light coming in from the top. You've got shadows under the leaves and at the leaves that are on the bottom because they're being shaded out by the ones on top. So, so try to do that going forward. But right now, let's look at the sticks, the, the upright parts. So take a little bit of the, your standard gray that we've mixed right at the beginning and add a little bit of brown to that. And then, so what I've got here is I've got one there, I've got one there and I've got one there, and they're gonna go back in slightly shorter and shorter and shorter intervals. Um, there's a whole lot of maths to calculating a receding vanishing point, um, which really I'm not going to go into now because I'm first of all, not very good at it and there are logarithms involved. And second, it's just exhausting and your eye can actually usually do a better job. So I'd say put this first one in as just a dark stripe down, wherever you decide to put this, just a dark stripe down to sort of not past your, you've got your quarter mark and you're gonna go slightly below that, but not too far below that. So put, put in a dark stripe that, that gives you that quarter mark. I'm gonna put in a few more based on just eyeballing where they should be. Um, what I'd suggest is that you only put in two. Don't, don't try and do lots. Do fewer rather than more. And make them thinner rather than thicker. Use your smallest brush and just put them in and then stop and step back and see what the distance is between them. See if it looks right, see if it feels right. And then add a tiny amount more. I think it's a little bit like when you're doing a soup or um, if you're doing makeup or there, there's just a thing where you add a little bit every single time that you go back to it and you don't overdo it. And then you step back and you look. And then you can be pretty sure because you've got eyeballs that you're getting the right idea. So stop and look and then go back and then stop and then look. So what happens with these, with these lines is they're going to go back you're going to get one set that goes back in one line and then another set behind it that goes back in another line and another set behind it that goes back in another line. It's not that important unless you're very, very, very pedantic to get all of it right. You just need to make sure that the bottoms are aligned. Everything else kind of squidgy. But you'll see here, all I'm doing is I'm making sure that the bottoms this one is aligned with that one. And that line goes back there. That one ends at about the same spot as that one does. I've got a little smudge that goes back there. This one's gonna need one in between because those have. And then smudge going back there. And you can see suddenly, magically, you end up with a whole three-dimensional landscape. Now I'm going to stop and ask for questions now because this is this isn't just technical this is where the magic happens. So let me know where you're getting confused. If you're getting confused. No, I think we're all good. <laughs> we have strangely, actually, I mean, looking at the paintings themselves, I'm actually sort of wondering if you guys cheated and just got a bunch of people who've actually studied before to, to come and do this lesson with me. Because <laughs> they're, they're actually really, they're, they're technically good. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a very high um, base standard 
of just how people are handling this. And either it means I'm a genius teacher, which I like to believe, or that people are just really getting it and kind of um, knowing how, how this stuff works. I think we can definitely give you some credits and say that you're a pretty good teacher there, Kim. And I will take all the credit I can get, but I'm also very chuffed with everybody because it's really, <laughs> I, seriously, well done, guys. This is, this is not, I could have chosen a much easier painting. Um, yeah, it's a, it, is, it is one of the more difficult paintings we've had on the paint and sip platform, but I oh, think hmm. that most of you are getting it. Right? Like, I know. I'm, I'm chuffed. <laughs> I'm just like really chuffed. And I think one of the main things I want people to remember is that that clumping effect, if you look in nature, you do see a lot less uniformity and you see a lot more weird clumping. Um, you see it in universes, you see it in trees. So don't be afraid of a bit of a kind of a mess and a bad cake mix, so to speak, because that's actually what happens quite naturally um, and that's what makes a thing organic as opposed to perfectly blended and artificial. <laughs> um, Lorna says, um, Kim, you're a brilliant teacher. Thank you. I'm using oil, so I cannot move on as fast and I'm not missing a beat though. I am enjoying every moment. So oh, that's so lovely. Well, the nice thing about this format is that you can watch it again. If you get, if you feel like you're tagging behind or lagging behind, wine is working, hey? Um, <laughs> the, uh, the nice thing is that oh, it's very effective wine, so <laughs> cheers. Um, it's, yeah, I love this format because you can go back and you can rewatch and you can learn more and you can actually do the same painting until you feel like you're completely comfortable with the concepts. But one of the reasons I love this picture is that it teaches stuff that you can use in so many different places. So it's not a, it's not just about the picture. It's like, oh, wow. So clumping is a thing. Oh, wow. So reflected light is a thing. It's got a whole lot of other stuff in it. And that lets me be my geeky self quite nicely. So thank you. Thank you so much for saying lovely things about me being an awesome teacher. And I totally believe you. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Kim. Well, you, you know, I love you guys. I keep coming back. It's been how many years now? <laughs> yeah, it has been. We've done so many different artworks. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, how's everyone doing? How is everyone feeling? More importantly, I think at this stage, everyone's sighing 
you know, that big sigh of relief, like, oh my gosh, I have a painting. Woohoo! I see Joanne and Jolyn in the background going, yay. Um, let us know how you are feeling. Pop your mics on. If you have any questions at this stage with those finishing touches of your vineyards. Um, yes. I've got a quick question about the house. So yes. I missed the little reflective bit. So I got the roof uh, okay. and the walls, but there was something about a reflection that oh. you just reminded me now that I forgot. My, it's just a bit flat, my house. Um, okay, can you hold it up to the camera? I'm gonna try and find, I'm really bad with this. Really? Thing. Okay. Have you got it? Is it up? <laughs> no, it looks lovely. Wait, where am I? I'm lost. Hang on. Oh, oh, it. Oh, oh, there we go. There it is. I see you. Yeah. That's beautiful. Um, so I see what you're saying. What you have is you've got the same tone on the side that is reflecting sunlight. Yeah. And on the side that is just in shade. Yeah. So your shade side is more blue than you might think it should be. So what I want, I, no, that was a bad, badly phrased sentence. So when you're painting shade in sunlight, it's always more blue than you think it should be. So you want to add more blue than you think you ought to. And then the sunlight where it strikes the house should actually be very slightly dirty white but also occurring on the side of blue. So I'm going to show you on this house, I'm just cleaning my brush because clean brushes really make a difference, especially when you're using white. So I'm going to pick up some pure white here and I'm going to show you on the edge of this house what a difference that pure white makes. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, okay. If you use a pure white, that can only be where the sunlight is hitting. You cannot use that pure white in the shade because you defeat yeah. the whole object of shade. But if you're using a pure white, you have to have a super clean brush, yeah. super neat edges. Okay, I had too much water on my brush now. Yeah, dry your brush so that it's the same same kind of wetness as the paint. Ah. Sparkles, once you put that pure white down. Okay, I'm gonna mute us again. Cool. cool. There is another question um, yes. by Dorette. How do you do the shading at the bottom of the poles? Oh, right, so what I've done is I've taken the shade from the poles, the dark tone from the poles, and literally all I've done, I'm gonna show you on my apron. All I've done there is I've, I've made a pole. Oh, that's a very wet brush, Kim. Um, I've made a pole and then I've smudged it. So I've, I've literally just dragged the color down from the top into this pole shape like that and then smudged it. Because it is slightly transparent, what happens is that it picks up all the colors from underneath and it looks super natural. Well, not super natural, it looks super natural. It looks very, very natural is I think what I'm trying to say. It does. And then another question here, how are we adding to the tops of the poles? Um, so, I'm gonna come back, sorry. Um, no, no, um, I think the question is, are we adding leaves to the top of the poles? You can put the leaves everywhere. The leaves are quite a natural organic thing. So some of them will rest on the top of the poles. Some of them will go off in their own direction. What I am gonna do is I'm gonna come back into the poles with a very, very pale brown, very pale. I'm busy mixing it on my palette at the moment. It's just sort of a mixture of the gray and some red and some yellow. 
Um, it's a dirty, dirty white, basically, is what I'm trying to make. And I'm going to drag it down one side of the pole. So I'm not going to, on these poles, I'll show you on the demo, I'm not going to put it over the whole pole. I'm going to put it on the one side, just on the one side. And that's going to give me a sunlight highlight on that side of the pole. So you take this. And then very slowly, 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 not just lightly, I mean like slowly, you drag it down one side of the pole. Make sure it's right, it's sort of blended a little bit, but you see that just comes to life. Suddenly that is a three-dimensional pole. And you can take a, a clean dry brush and just smudge the inside edge like you did with the clouds. The crisp edge differentiates it, separates it from the background on the one edge. And that blurry edge makes it part of the rest of the pole on the other side. And what you want to do on each pole is not make them the same. You want that kind of organic sunlight coming, filtering through leaves to come down onto that pole. If it all looks the same, they don't look natural. It looks like the leaves are completely separate from the poles. But if you've got kind of a bit of a mess going, because the leaves are kind of a bit of a mess, you get this beautiful natural sunlight, dappled sunlight coming onto the poles. And that makes such a difference to how three-dimensional this looks. And I think I'm going to say that this is probably, I know this is a painting that one tends to faff with for a long time, but this is as close to a final touch as you get on a painting like this. Because you will keep wanting to fiddle and learn and fidget. And that's actually okay, because that's what a painting like this is for. It's not necessarily always where you want to end up. It's kind of where you want to be. It's what you want to be playing with. It's what you want to be exploring. Um, I have another question. This one's a little bit unique in the sense that um, the person asking the question doesn't have a webcam. So they've sent me a photograph of what they're doing and they've asked if I can show you the photograph okay. on the webcam. So let's, let's <laughs> if do you this. please um, just give a little bit of guidance on how to enhance um, this particular painting. Um, here I come with my phone but now it might get a bit glary and I, I'm going to try and avoid that. Can you see that then? Um. I'm going to lift it up a bit so it's not as glary because like we're screen on screen here. Oh, there we go. I see it. I see what she's done. She doesn't have enough necessarily. I, th I think it's a beautifully structured painting, but perhaps more browns in the, in the vineyard. So that, that earth tone needs to kind of be messily included in the, the oranges of the vineyard. And maybe some of the oranges of the vineyard can go up into the trees. Because they're, it's beautiful in that every single color is so crisp and clean. And I actually really love that. Um, love but I feel like maybe the only, the only thing I would say is maybe a little bit more of the earth tones could be showing through the vineyards. Or, or, not necessarily and, but it could just be or. Those trees are a bit too uniform. Okay. Okay, great. Other than that, it is actually a really lovely painting. I think maybe just, if you just add more depth and darkness to the undersides of those trees in that kind of splodgy way, you'll have a perfect result. Lovely. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. It was a really cool question. <laughs> like getting to, getting you to want to watch your photographs, you can. <laughs> it's an option. Um, okay, so haven't got any other questions here in the chat bar. Um, I do have another 
We absolutely love Kim. Thank you for today. It's been a great lesson and we really appreciate the guidance from Janine and Chris. Oh, thank you. So, um, we have a lot of fans. And Renata's just trying to ask a question. Renata, you're on mute, love. Okay. I, I find my... Oh, we are. I find my. In, I don't know if you can see this. You have to turn the uh, thing on. I can see. This is terrible. People in the room. Yes, if they turn their sound off on their side, then it should be okay, Renata. There's two of us. Okay, so Here. the other person needs to Listening. switch off. Listening. If you can turn one of the speakers off, that would help. Oh, there we go. <laughs> That's handy. Now you're in the other screen. There we go. You're on mute. You're on mute. It's the slogan of 2020. <laughs> It really is. Oh, the number of times I've heard people say you're on mute. Oh. Here we go. Now we got it. I find my my vineyard too orangey. How do I get yes. a better vineyard feel in there? Do you see that? Right. That's a very good question. So what I do is I would take a little bit of that sky blue. Yeah. Just a tiny bit of the sky blue and mix it in with your orange. Okay. Oh, okay. And then just go over it a little bit to get rid of Try the... Splodgy, okay, is, splodgy is your favorite word. Just make it splodgy. Um, okay, good. So make sure it's lighter on the top and darker yeah. underneath. And then use your sky blue in the orange. That'll neutralize okay. it quite a lot. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Anybody else want to show us their um, show us their artwork? Ask us a question. Maybe um, Kim can offer some guidance. Oh, I'm looking at the. the hi, hi, Kim. Hi. Does that look fine? Um, is this? Oh, I just lost the image. Uh, Yunsef. It's my name's Bahana. Um. I know it is the Yunsef um, screen though. You were looking at that, but her name is uh, Mahala. Not so, okay. Alex. Hi, Alex. Really? My, my name's Farhana. Farhana, yeah. hi. Um, this is, it's very, very lovely. Um, is there any area that you're feeling uncomfortable about? Because the I. The trees, I, the trees in the background actually, they don't do it for me. Is there a question very specifically? Because I quite like the image as it is. Um, I don't think that it needs fixing in any way. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely image. Thank you so much. Ta. Okay. It's a pleasure. Kim, can you see mine? Louise. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, hi. Hold, if you hold it up, I will... Um, you can let me know when you can see it. Can you see it? Just your face. Oh no, that's not good. <laughs> Get my face. <laughs> we need to see the picture. Can you see the picture now? Okay, I can see the picture now. Um, tilt your phone slightly forward. There's a little bit of lag. Just hang on a sec while our media catches up. Yay, telecom. Um, it's taking a while and fortunately it's lagging a little bit. No, it's okay. I don't I don't really have any questions. I'm I'm quite happy with it. I think I'm going to carry on painting. I think I'm gonna put yeah. some little bunches of grapes on the okay. vineyards just for fun. My yeah, when you, when you do the grapes. Anything like yours, but <laughs> I'm happy with it. My I cottage think it's lovely. Yeah. I think it's really lovely. When you do the grapes, be very careful to use, um, to try and keep them transparent. 
I think is the only bit of advice I'd give you and get, take lots of breaks in between. It's very easy to overdo it when you put grapes in. So do you think I should just put a little bit of subtle like burgundy little, little yeah. plum? Okay, okay, just hidden yeah. beneath the, 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 okay, okay. Very easy to overdo them because they're so delicious to look at and to paint. So take lots of breaks and um, make sure that you have a, um, a lot of trouble. Try and use a transparent paint and have a wet rag handy to clean it off in case you don't like it. Okay, so, so did I do some honor in, in, in capturing your picture? I hope. I think so, yeah, this is beautiful. I mean, it's still, it's still quite lagged. So I've basically got the top three quarters of it. Oh, I can't gosh. Of it. Oh, there now? Um, it's still lagged. We're, um, I'm going to try. No, but it's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm happy with it. I, yeah, I, it looks good from what I can see. <laughs> okay. Awesome. No, I'm just missing a little bit at the bottom where, so if you look at my screen, I'm missing like that part. Let me have a look but at your screen. Else is lovely. Okay. holding up her painting to you. Um, yeah, I see Fleur. Fleur, Fleur that is no, but it's, very lovely. No, but it's fine. Thank you for a, a lovely tuition and a lovely picture to paint. I'm going to just, I'm not going to overdo it too much. I'm going to try not to overdo it too much and I will take guidance yeah. in what you said. Light, light hand is the best advice I can give you. Yes, but, but thank you for a lovely afternoon. And Alex and, and Steve. Lovely. Thank you it was for really awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Um, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a lot of people that are um, that are tagging, you know, their painting and such online. So again, don't forget we do have a giveaway. You know, take some selfies, take some pictures of your artwork, pop them online, and um, tag Paint and Sip ZA as well as Kim Moby. And don't, don't run off just yet. We still have another giveaway, but I'm not entirely sure, Kim. Um, are, we, are we sort of at the We're end? We're pretty done. I'm, I'm waiting for questions to roll in. I'm uh, staying online. I'm not going anywhere. Thank you, guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm on mute. Thank you. <laughs> so, for me, this would be the ultimate fidget painting. Thank you so much, Louise. Please keep going. It's a beautiful painting. Um, Fleur, your painting is gorgeous as well. Um, yeah, I think this is, this is a lovely painting to keep fiddling with because you can. I don't think there's any other good reason except that you can. Uh, I've, I've got a few from previous paint and sips that I've, I've kind of kept playing with and fiddling with and then eventually sold because that was the only way I was ever going to stop. Um, is that somebody actually bought it and took it away from me. Um, so just keep enjoying, you know, um, and, and join for, for more of these because they're, um, it's, it's an amazing cause and I thoroughly love working with you guys. You're, mm. you're always, it's a lovely bunch of people who I teach and it's such a nice bunch of people to work with. You too, Kim. Um, I'm sure we need to sign our name though, right? That was one of your handy tips for... Um, so, if you want to sign your name, I would suggest doing it as small as you possibly can on a canvas like this, with a canvas with a color that's similar to the paint in the background. So don't use black and make it big in the corner because otherwise that's all that anybody's going to see. I'll actually show you how I do my signature. I'm going to sign this one and then I'll give it to paint and sip. But I actually make it really, really tiny in the corner and I take my time with it. I don't try and do it fast. And there is, there is a signature. You can even use a good graphite pencil. I wouldn't suggest a ballpoint pen because that ink does fade. But a good pencil, or if you can manage to get the edge of a brush like this, it's good. It's useful.
And you don't, you really don't want it to be bigger than this because otherwise that's all anybody's gonna see. So you can see there's a tiny little smudge in the corner. And if I lift it up, you'll see my name there. But you want it to be small, unobtrusive, and very clearly written. So you want to use a name that isn't just something like Kim. If I sign my paintings Kim, everybody could copy them. I could sign them Moby because it's the weird bit. The weird bit is the thing that makes you unique in art yeah. and in life. The weird bit matters. So use, use a unique signature, make it small, unobtrusive, but very, very legible. <laughs> Oh, it's beautiful, Kim. Woo! Well done. That looks absolutely amazing. Thank you, everybody. You've done an astonishingly good job. Lovely. Um, I do want to take... Oh, it was lovely. Yeah. I saw a snippet. <laughs> That's I have, yeah. Um, I have a few people that are asking a few questions, so... Yes. Um, where do you, well, I think there might be more about just like the general posting of pictures. So where do we post pics? You can post them on your own platforms, but um, please tag Paint and Sip ZA um, and tag Kim Moby. That'll be great. And then we'll, we'll get notifications of those tags. Um, and then in terms of the recordings, we are going to be editing this recording just so that it is YouTube friendly. And then we will put it onto our Paint and Sip ZA um, YouTube page. You'll be able to access that. Um, but we do have to allow our editing team just a little bit of time. So um, you can expect that sort of midweek from around Wednesday, Thursday onwards. It does give a little bit of time for you to step back from the painting and take a look at it and then maybe um, on Wednesday or Thursday you'll be able to do some of those touch-ups if you'd like to go back. But I'd like um, to take an opportunity Kim just to say a huge thank you to you. Thank you so much for joining us again. We absolutely love you and you've had so much amazing feedback in the chat. Um, guys, well please put your mics on and um, let's give Kim a round of applause, <laughs> a virtual round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, I think everyone's pieces are absolutely Thank you. 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 What an amazing experience. Thank you. My, my first Zoom lesson, and it was just, I, I was very, 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 very happy to see such amazing results. Like, really, really great results. Beautiful. Thank you for your yeah. Thank you. You're a natural, Kim. You're a natural virtual teacher. <laughs> so my, may I just say something? Um, just a, a huge thank you to Alex and Stephen for just doing this. I mean, you guys are awesome. Um, yeah. And first, you've actually just been able to, to make it, take it from the ARIA or wherever, um, virtual. And here we are in our homes having just as much fun, only because of you guys. Oh, so thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you. They are amazing, right? Oh so goodness. amazing. They're amazing. They're really amazing. They're, they're so rock. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. You guys, the only reason that we're able to do it is because of all of the support. So without each and every one of you here and your um, sort of, dedicated can I say support um, we wouldn't be able to do this so thank you we really appreciate it and we appreciate each and every one of you thank you um, I'd like to take an opportunity to, to, to do a um, screenshot of everyone in house so if you feel comfortable to please pop your cameras on and show us your pieces like this there's um, enough people here that span over two screens. So <laughs> I do need a little, a little moment. And Kim, if you can also hold up the, paint, the painting that you've just done. Um, you're actually welcome to stop your screen share now, Kim, because I'm going to need to screen share. Oh, you can keep it like that. That's fine. Uh, actually, no, 
I'm going to need you to stop screen sharing and I'm going to need you to flip it over and show it to your front facing camera if you can for me, please. Mm. Just so that I'm able to get a gallery view of everyone. That's it. Fantastic. And then, um, and then, Kim, if possible, <laughs> um, if you can please send the techie fairy up stairs so that he can help me with the screenshot because <laughs> I don't know I how to use he's on his way. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, he's on his way. I think he, he overheard our... <laughs> okay, great. Okay. This it's okay. We're using several different pieces of technology to get this through to you guys. Everyone's holding up their painting um, so that we can see your painting um, and then we are going to do a quick screenshot of you guys. I'm going to go, um, Everybody's doing oh, okay, okay, all right, are we ready? I'm going to go one, two, three, sorry, we did freeze for a second, I don't know why, but anyway, we're back, we're back at it, okay. One, two, three, Ta -da! lovely. And then um, the stent go to the page. Okay, no, don't worry about that. Okay. All right, guys, well done. Awesome. That was fantastic. I have a screenshot of everyone. Yay. Um, so to finish off, now everyone could round of applause. Well done. You finally have um, you finally have a gorgeous piece that you can display in your bathroom I'm going to now share my screen because I'm going to the room I can get a sense of if everyone can see this wheel of um can you see yes no I'm going to put myself on mute though. We're just having a technical glitch. It'll be right in a moment. Um, so, hello. Hello, and I'm so sorry that we, um, you want to see our we pictures, went Jeff? offline for a few seconds. I see and Zoom is a bit unstable on our end. We're trying to figure out why. They'll be fine with this. Is it as long as, yeah, as long as there was a good You guys can see. Oh, you guys can <laughs> All right. So, Just a standard telecom problem.
<laughs> Hello. <laughs> I don't know why, but Zoom decided to not play nice anymore. And um, for some other reason, it crashed upstairs on my side. So the only technical difficulty there is that, unfortunately, um, I will only be able to do the randomizer. I'm still going to do it, but I'm going to put it onto our paint and sip page. So please take a look at our paint and sip page. Um, we'll do the randomizer and whoever wins there, will, it will be on the page. And then also please remember to take photos, tag them, tag Paint and Sip ZA, tag Kimobi. Um, and I think we're gonna say thank you and farewell just before we crash again. I don't know what's happening. Telcom, it's, it's always telcom. It's, but I'm so glad that we were able to have the lesson and it only started crashing now. So you feel free to put your, your um, mics on to say goodbye. We um, love each and every one of you. We appreciate you guys so much and we can't wait for next month. Thank you so much for joining and thank you, Kim. Thank Yay. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 How many people did you have? How many people did you have today? Thanks, everyone. I think we had about a hundred. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yes. Congratulations. Wow. Looking forward to the next one. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you so us. much. Celebrate. If anybody deserves a glass of wine, honestly. Bye. Because that, that's not going to work without the top. There you go. That's how that. Yay. Then you pour it, then you put it in your water. Then we yeah, drink. Do you want some more? No, God. Okay. <laughs> Bye, guys. Cry. Clink, clink, clink. Bye, bye, loves. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful whatever's left of your weekend. <laughs>